meeting the Concord Select Board to order. The first item on our agenda this afternoon is a consent agenda on which there are town account warrants to get acceptance of a, a Wi-Fi hotspot van for the town meeting for from Comcast. <laughs> and we were but where was that when we needed it? Yeah, we we're grateful for that uh, help to support our annual town meeting and I would entertain a motion. Move to accept the consent agenda. Second. Would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Ackerman? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. Ms. Hotchkiss? Aye. Mr. Lawson? Aye. Myself, Ms. Escobedo, aye. Thank you, and I note that it passes unanimously. The next item on our agenda is the town manager's update. Mr. Town Manager. Hi, Hal. Um, I, I, I suppose I should have formally announced that the internet outage that, that, was, that was experienced by broadband, Concord Broadband users was um, triggered by a power outage um, over at Emerson Hospital that had fairly far-reaching um, impacts to the, to the CMLP system and it was caused naturally by a squirrel, squirrel chewing on wires. Um, and so, uh, and, and I think they were trying to get information on, they sent, did send out a news and notices right away, but if you didn't have internet, that wasn't gonna be, um, no, sorry, the news and notices was about the um, water main break last week, which was also a significant uh, event. Yeah. Uh, CPW did a really remarkable job tracking that and repairing it. Uh, really kind of in short order. It was a 12 inch line. So a lot of damage uh, with the line that big. Um, so uh, just briefly, uh, I, there are a lot of, it's a fun week this week in Concord. So we have a few events I just want to note. We do have another drive-in movie. Uh, it's Thursday night at seven, the, the lot will open at seven o'clock. The movie is Shrek. Uh, I don't think there are passes available, but people can go to the, um, uh, Concord Tourism uh, website, uh, visitconcord.com, and see if there are available. Uh, and then Saturday, both in downtown and in West Concord, there's going to be a socially distant sidewalk sale. Uh, a, a large number of businesses, both downtown and in West Concord, are participating. Uh, we'll be blocking off, the town will be blocking off some requested parking spaces. Several businesses have identified spots that they wanted blocked, so we'll be doing that again. Um, and that hopefully they have great weather for that because it's it's a great event and it, it definitely brings a sense of life back into the downtown. And then uh, this week, uh, t uh, ten families I think who won um, a contest or a raffle or something um, will be at the umbrella painting canvases that will about their COVID nineteen experience that will then be used to cover um, picnic tables that that have been purchased for outdoor eating. So people get takeout and they want to eat at a picnic table, one of our open spaces, it'll be covered with a canvas uh, mural that's, that, are, that are painted by Concord family. So uh, keep your eye out for that. Um, I don't really have too much more than, than that to offer and I'll happily, uh, the sidewalk sale I should have mentioned is nine to five. Um, and I'll happy to take questions. Uh, before we take questions, I'll just, uh... I'll just say that uh, there's 23 businesses in downtown and 13 businesses in West Concord that are participating in this. You know, we had a previous one that was in uh, the downtown area that was a big success. And so I'm really glad to see the businesses in West Concord joining uh, this one. So are there questions for the town manager? Jane? Um, I wanted to just uh, ask how, how we're going to enforce the new no more than 50 people um, gathering uh, rules in both uh, West and, and, and Concord Center for this? That seems a little tricky because it, it can get pretty compact. It can, I, I guess I view the sidewalk sale as not really an, an event. It is where no, individual businesses are having them. And you can make the case that each individual business is having its own outdoor event. And so 50 times 23, I don't know that the, that the governor would look at it that way, but um, because it is, uh, it is essentially commercial activity that could be happening with or without the outdoor gathering limit. Um, I don't know that I would call it an outdoor gathering. Uh, the movie, people will need to stay in their cars. Um, we were, we were a little bit, um, you know, um, flexible with, with it 
at the last movie, but I think this time around because because the limit has dropped and we already pre we already pre I say pre sold we already obligated a hundred t- t- tickets to passes to that people will probably need to stay in their cars. Okay, um, I just want to reiterate that you know while while we can call things different thing different by different names, the virus doesn't respect that, so right. we yeah. maintain the um, rigidity of social distancing. Um, also, I just wanted to know if there was any follow up to the water main from last week because I think some of us were we were yeah no, no not that I've heard before. what's that I said some I, I I have been wondering how that that finished out uh, no it, it so basically what happened is when the, when the twelve inch main ruptured right at the intersection of Thoreau and and um, Main Street um, the pressure of the entire system dropped um, briefly. Uh, right. But after after a short time, the pressure was restored. They were able to locate and isolate the section of uh, a pipe that had burst, and they had it um, put back together and paved. I think the following day. Okay, so there's no there's no long term concern. No, no, they did an excellent job um, tending to it. Oh, let me say this: if there is, I haven't been notified of that. No, yeah. thanks. Right, thank you, Jane. Uh, are there any more questions for the town manager? Uh, Terry? I just wanted to um, respond to what Jane said. Um, absolutely, it's important to keep social distanced. But I think um, the limit going down to 50 it doesn't take effect till Tuesday. So I think technically, you know, legally, we're not going to be, but the money respect that. You're absolutely right. So people should wear masks and stay socially distanced. So one of the things I, I forgot to mention is that I did have a conversation last Friday um, with the restaurants. Uh, we have an email list and I, that I reached out to. It was not widely attended, but we had a good conversation about um, strategies for, um, uh, uh, for really you know, encouraging people to support their local restaurants and, and local businesses. And I think one of the things that we all agreed on is that the steps that business owners, restaurants and retailers are taking to keep themselves, their employees and their customers safe uh, are really thorough. And, and people really need to, to observe firsthand that they are following the guidance. They all have COVID safety plans. They're hand sanitizing stations. Um, the uh, employees are wearing masks. They're requiring patrons to wear masks. So I think it's the really important message to, to really, that I think needs to be heard is that the business community is, is doing absolutely everything they can do to reopen um, as safely as possible. And I think if people do um, attend the sidewalk sale or do go to a, a local restaurant, which I hope they will, they'll see that it is a, um, that all the safety precautions that, that can be taken are, are being taken and, and that people are taking it seriously. So uh, I, I appreciate you bringing that up, Jane, because I, I should have mentioned that at the beginning. Um, and the conversation with the restaurants is ongoing. Um, we know we're going to need to have a new dialogue uh, as the fall, uh, as the weather turns cooler and outdoor dining isn't going to be as available. And, uh, but right now we're just working towards trying to find ways to promote um, local businesses and making sure that we're making it as easy as possible for restaurants to operate. I would just say also that uh, as nice an event as it was a few weeks ago, it was fairly easy to maintain social distance. There were a lot of people, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't the kind of packed crowd that you, yep. that, that you otherwise might see. It was, it was pretty, I was there for about a couple of hours and it seemed to work out pretty well. Yeah, and yeah. I think what, what you see, sorry, what you see is stores will, will count um, and they'll put a, a, a piece of a, you know, a rope or a you know a chair or something in the doorway to ensure that you know that they're that they are following the capacity restrictions. Yeah. Uh, and so when you go down there, you'll see a lot of a lot of activity. But you'll also, Mike's right, you'll see um, a lot of a lot of um, social distancing and mask wearing too. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for the town manager? All right, seeing none, the next um, agenda item is my chair's remarks. I just have two very quickly. First, uh, not this week, but next week on the 19th, uh, we'll hold uh, the chair's breakfast again. So I look forward to interacting with all the committee and board chairs uh, on the 19th. This time it'll be at nine in the morning. 
The second is just a reminder that next week is a very busy week for the town. We have public hearings on the 17th, 18th, and 19th. The 17th is a joint one with the Select Board and Finance Committee. The 18th is a Finance Committee public hearing, and the 19th is a Planning Board public hearing. And the Select Board and the Finance Committee will be meeting after the meetings on the 17th and the 18th to take positions on the Warren Articles. And on the 19th, I believe the Finance Committee is going to meet after the Planning Board public hearing and the Select Board will meet at nine o'clock Thursday morning on the 20th. So that by the morning of the 20th, we'll have positions taken by the Finance Committee and the Select Board on all our Warren articles. And I select, suspect the Planning Board will be uh, doing the same, although I don't have their exact meeting information. Uh, I want to say also with respect to the public hearings that there is a lot of information that's going to be available and starting to go online and what I have recommended uh, along with the uh, town moderator is that for each of the Warren articles that are going to be heard at each of the uh, public hearings that there's a folder or a link created that would take you to all of the material that's going to be available for that particular Warren article. And I've started that process. I will be presenting on Article 16. And I've started that process by uh, completing a PowerPoint presentation, uh, creating pictures of the site, uh, posting the revised TIF agreement, a letter from the state awarding tax credits, the Junction Village pro formas, the MOA between Junction Village, excuse me, between the Grantham Group and the CHDC and a link to the Junction Village page on the town website, which includes a lot of background information that was made available for the public hearing that we had in February. So I will just say to everybody who's interested in these uh, public hearings, check the, the website and you should be able to start seeing as early as tomorrow the, the, uh, the information for these public hearings. And for all of those presenting, uh, please pay attention to the guidelines and deadlines that were provided by the town in terms of uh, coming up with your uh, presentations or supporting material. And lastly, uh, on, on this, I know that for some Warren articles, uh, there is an anticipation that there would be a, an amendment to a, a Warren article. The amendments are not part of sort of what the agenda is for our public hearings, although it's perfectly valid for anybody to mention uh, their plan for a public uh, for an amendment. But please, if you do have a proposed amendment to any Warren article, please get it in writing to the town moderator as soon as you can so that we are uh, fumbling around at town meeting trying to get information organized and presented when we're not going to have overhead screens and all that. So if you do have an amendment, please get it to the uh, town moderator as, as soon as you can. So that concludes my remarks. The next uh, item on our agenda is a public hearing, a livery license application for Home is Best Care Transportation, LLC, located at 3336 Baker Avenue. And I would entertain a motion to open the public hearing. After you unmute yourself. So move. Second. All right, would the clerk please call the roll. Linda, you're on mute. Yep, thank you. Um, Ms. Ackerman? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. Ms. Hotchkiss? Aye. Mr. Lawson? Aye. Myself, Ms. Escobedo? Aye. Thank you. I know the passage unanimously. I see someone with the sign Home is Best as the background, so I assume you were here to join us for this. Would you please unmute yourself and introduce yourself, please? Yes, yes, please. My name is Abou Mugalu. I hope everyone can hear me well. And I, I am uh, the office manager for the company Home is Best. Um, and I, it's my first meeting with the, the town select when I, I, I thank you for uh, having me here and, and for, uh, uh, for the vote. Um, uh, so, so we've been in town for the last four years, going on five years. When we have a home care agency uh, that's operating in Concord. We have clients um, you know, all, all over 
you know, the, 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 the state, but we're based out of uh, Concord there on, on Baker Avenue. Um, and if, if there's any questions that you might have, so we, we've been taking care of, of seniors uh, for a very long time, but we decided to add this uh, transportation aspect to, to our business because we found that there was a need for it, especially before the, the pandemic hit. And I mean, since it did, uh, everything seems to have kind of come to a halt. But, all right, so I take it the oh, business is taking care of, of seniors. Uh, in... Yes, go ahead, please. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, so you, the ongoing business is providing care for seniors, and this is an add-on business to essentially take seniors back and forth to medical appointments or shopping or other services that they might need and are difficult to uh, accomplish without adequate transportation. That Exactly what it is. Yes, that's it. That's right. it. Let me ask the board if there are any questions. I note the application is complete and in order and uh, has been approved. Yes, Linda. Um, I just have a, a general question about your um, uh, main business, and I assume you're uh, credited or licensed by other groups as well. We do not actually have a, we used to have. A, licensing in the state for home care agencies, but that was discontinued. Uh, actually, the first year we joined. Um, so we have a license, we have we got a license for that year, but the, the state does not license uh, home care agencies any longer. Although, you know, there's groups working to, to try and change that um, uh, within within our, our industry. Um, we are uh, 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 insured, uh, fully insured, and, and we have, uh, uh, we, we collaborate with other agents, with other uh, uh, organizations uh, uh, like Healthcare Alliance uh, in, in, in the state and, and, and other, care, uh, other home care agents, organizations um, that we collaborate with. So uh, I hope I answered that question. Well, you we have an, an official license from the state uh, because that, that doesn't uh, apply to our industry any longer. Thank you. How many employees do you, does the company have? We have uh, uh, anywhere between 20 and 50 employers, employees. Um, so not all of them are active at, at the same time because, uh, you know, due to the nature of our industry, you know, we, we, we lose clients and gain clients from time to time. And as, as many clients as we have, we, uh, uh, that's the, the, uh, the, the what determines the number of clients that, of, of employees that are active? And how many? How many will be participating in this uh, livery or taxi service? So currently, we have just one vehicle uh, for transportation. Um, uh, well, in in the coming years, we're hoping we can add one or two other vehicles, but that will depend on the volume of clients that we get. Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, does the uh, Terry? Well, how many drivers do you have and how many um, clients will be in the vehicle at the same time? So we are expecting to have a single uh, client in the vehicle at the same time uh, because um, we're, we're going to be operating based on appointments that, pre, that are prearranged. Um, so the appointment that we take will have to be made uh, at least a week ahead of time and uh, we'll be taking one person at a time as, as, as you know we're coming That's good. And obviously right because of the the restrictions with covid i, I think uh, things have, have changed very drastically and won't be uh, we'll be enforcing a strict one person right uh, one person. Yeah. how many drivers uh, will be working on this? So, so far we have just one driver uh, that, and that's actually the owner of the company that will, will be driving because we don't have uh, enough clients to take on more than, uh, okay. to, to hire more than one driver yet. Um, as time goes on, we'll, we might, well, once we get a new, a new vehicle, we'll probably have to get another driver. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? I, uh, are there any questions from 
the audience. If you have a question, if you uh, would um, unmute yourself and let me know who you are. I don't see anybody wishing to speak, so I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Move to close the public hearing. A second. second. Would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Ackerman? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. Ms. Hodgkiss? Aye. Mr. Lawson? Aye. Myself, Ms. Escobedo? Aye. Thank you. Does the select board have any additional comments or questions? I don't uh, have any, any questions. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, Madam Clerk, I would entertain a motion. I move to approve the livery license application from Home is Best Care Transportation, LLC. So a second. Okay. Would the clerk please call the roll? Okay. Ms. Ackerman? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. Ms. Hotchkiss? Aye. Mr. Lawson? Aye. Myself, Ms. Escobedo? Aye. Thank you. I know it passes unanimously. Thank you very much for coming, and we wish you the very best with your business. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. The next item on our agenda is the continued public hearing. What's uh, excuse me? Yeah. I apologize to uh, the school superintendent. You should have thrown something at me, Dr. Hunter. Totally fine. <laughs> uh, the next item on our agenda is the school reopening plans. Uh, Superintendent Hunter, I apologize for that. No uh, problem. Please introduce yourself for the record. Lori Hunter, Superintendent of Schools. Thank you very much, Dr. Hunter. We're delighted to have you here and to hear about the, the reopening plans. I must first sort of congratulate you and uh, the school committee for all the hard work and your and your staff at the at the various schools for I know what must have just been a unbelievably difficult assignment of trying to get this plan worked out. So the town is grateful to you for all the work you did. Uh, thank you. And it's clearly been a uh, very inclusive and uh, very widely participated in endeavor, and it continues on every day here as we make our way through the rest of the summer. So. I have, I have some slides that I uh, initially used with the school committee and thought it would give us a place to talk through uh, what we've been doing and what we're planning, but this is a dialogue, so please make it a conversation and ask questions along the way. I don't need to just lecture you. So let me just screen share for a moment. Um, so we started this part of the process back in May. We weren't out of the 2019 2020 school year yet and we thought we could see we were going to have a lot of work to do so we initially put together ideas and a structure back at the end of may and then through the months of june and july we really worked through a very inclusive collaborative process that engaged a lot of stakeholders um, and we are now executing the plan that came as a result of those processes and discussions at the building level and really in the logistical mode here of trying to make sure um, we've got it all in place. So just high level viewpoint view of what we've been doing. Uh, in, the, in May, the school committee created a COVID-19 task force. Uh, that's been the umbrella group that really has had the big picture view of all the work we've been doing. Around that, we created uh, working groups, and I'll show you those in a minute. There were four of them with more narrow focus areas. We also created a building-based task force at each school and the preschool. So that's a total of 11 committees running over the course of those two months. Um, and the ebb and flow between those is really how we got to where we are. During that process, we put out surveys to parents, staff, and students. We also held forums and fo focus groups also for parents, staff, and students. And that input had high impact on what we finally put together for a plan. The four working groups that really took on various pieces of all of this, uh, the health and safety group obviously highly focused on the protocols, PPE, hand washing, um, looking at how we would socially distance regularly and consistently, um, use of the schools, visitors, large groups. The whole child group really focused on making sure we never lost track 
of our emotional, the emotional needs of our kids, and I'm going to add the adults too. Um, we had what we were calling a mental health crisis before all of this started with the pandemic, and we must keep it high on our radar that we've now all been in living through uh, an emergency. And as we re-enter school, that would be the case. Um, and we need to be sure we're supporting everyone in that, both at the aggregate and at an individual level. Blended learning is our way of talking about everything, teaching, learning, and otherwise, um, whether we're talking in person or remote, the use of technology obviously becoming very critical, professional development, some of our special populations, special ed, ELL, and MECO, um, and then really talking and working with parents. They've become partners in education in a way never, never before, and we wanna be sure we're supporting them as well. And then finally, the operations group really looked at the core operations that run and sometimes uh, drive literally the school system. So food service, transportation, cleaning, and the maintenance of the schools, and then any facility use. The building-based groups, which are now actively running weekly um, because they are going to continue throughout the summer. Those other four groups have um, wound down as we got into August. They're working on the plans coming out of those big groups and executing them. While each building has its own group, the elementary schools are communicating regularly so that they stay on the same page while having their own nuance. Um, and obviously we're working really hard at communication between all the different councils and committees that are happening. The state put out to us back in June, a directive to look at three models to reopen. Um, You'll see the green box there. That's the one where we go back as normal. That was not one of the three. That was the fourth that we will all aspire to um, post, post pandemic. Of the three we had to look at were in-person learning with safety requirements, which means all kids go back to school. Um, a hybrid model where there's kids simultaneously at home and at school at the same time. And then an all remote model, which is what we did March through June of last spring. Um, a couple of just nuances that'll come up as I go through the slides. We are offering an all remote, all remote model at all times, so parents can opt into that instead of going into the hybrid or in-person models. Um, and there will be some kids who uh, probably have more than just a hybrid model based on their needs. So there's actually as many to three to five groups happening all the time that we're planning for. So we reviewed the in-person model, which is technically per the state's definition, all kids going back at once. Where we landed was that um, we're able to do that with a six foot distance between students at the elementary schools. We we're so fortunate to have low class sizes and large classrooms. We've decided to bring all of them back five days per week, but on a half day schedule in person. So they'll do the morning at the schools. And then we would be looking to send them home for the afternoon where they'll pick up remote learning and have a combination of independent work, software, academic software, and synchronous instruction, which is our way of saying Zoom um, with teachers or support staff. We've we ruled that out at the middle and high school. There are just simply um, too many kids. The class sizes are a little bigger. The square footage at each classroom is a little smaller. The structures of those schools are very different and the kids are traveling. And so we deemed that that was not possible. This is an elementary. This is a classroom at Thoreau set up for 18 students, six feet apart. So we modeled it and tried it and got a feel for it before we decided to put it out there as an option. The hybrid model we then considered for all three areas as we were asked to, because of what we were proposing for all kids to go back at the elementary schools in the morning, we did not create an added hybrid model where some of them are at home and some of them are at school, it just became way too confusing to change schedules um, so dramatically. So at the middle and high school, however, this is the model we would be using to bring kids back into the schools. Um, essentially, we split them in half by alphabet and group one comes on Monday and Thursday. Group two will come on Tuesdays and Fridays. Wednesdays will likely alternate. We're still in discussion on what those will look like. Um, but the schedules will be essentially the same, whether you're at school or at home. And we're working and talking a lot with teachers on what that will look like. We want kids to be engaged, but we don't want them on Zoom all day. 
So there'll be a combination of live events and activities for them and then independent work when they're at home. In person will feel closer to the regular classroom, but with all of the safety protocols in place. So this is, I think these are, this is Sanborn uh, staged at six feet apart. Um, class sizes with only half the kids coming of somewhere between 12, mostly around 12, occasionally 15. The lower picture is a special education setting. And then this is the high school at the same distance. We are planning a remote model for all schools. Um, we know that that's a likelihood at any point. While we're talking about the hope to bring kids back, there is always the chance that we're not gonna be able to do that or that we're gonna get back and have to go back out again, um, all dependent on the health data. So we would essentially replicate the days we are building for the in-person and hybrid models at a remote level. Um, and this is very different than what we did in the spring. We were in a true crisis mode in the spring of trying to turn everything around on a dime and make sure we gave kids opportunities and um, learning activities. This is about accomplishing as much of the regular curriculum as possible. So there'll be combinations of um, synchronous and individual projects. We believe there'll be um, a good amount of synchronous. Again, we don't want kids on Zoom six hours a day. So we'll be um, likely kicking them off and letting them work independently as part of the period. Um, it all depends on the activity and the instruction that teachers are planning, but it will be a robust remote program, very closely aligned to what the school day looks like with a lot of um, adaptations to curriculum to make that doable. Yeah, Mike, go ahead. Uh, you're, you'll be having simultaneous in-class and remote instruction. Will the teacher be doing both or will separate teachers be doing in-class and remote? Yeah, good question. Uh, we're talking that through. Uh, right now, what we're planning for the hybrid model is a combination of kids being able to get into the live instruction. And sometimes what that will mean is they're actually watching their teacher, but more, more often we're leaning toward, and this is an active conversation even this week, um, that they'll be partnering with uh, an in-person buddy if they're remote so that they can collaborate. One of the things we've realized when the kids are in school with the six foot distance, we love doing group work and we think that's a really important thing to do, but suddenly it's very hard to do in the in-person setting. So partnering them up with an in-person and a remote buddy together actually becomes a really doable option and gives us a way to connect the kids that are home. Um, we're also going to be using things like Google Docs, where there's just live interaction going on. And then sometimes the kids at home will have an independent project to do, and they won't be connected directly into the classroom, but their teacher is going to see them at the next school day. So we're, we're fine with a combination of that. So it's a little bit of everything. Um, and what we're trying right now is build a, the teacher's toolkits so they have options and they have ways to stay connected with kids and balance out the um, pretty complicated piece of having some of them in front of them and some of them at home. Thank you. You're welcome. I can't see all of you, so um, feel free to say something if you have a question. Uh, so we are aiming for, uh, right now we're thinking planning for an in-person opening. Again, everything is qualified with the fact we don't know what the next few weeks will bring. Um, virus data will need to stay stable and low for that to even be a possibility to stay on the table. Um, we are offering parents the option to opt out of in-person. I put out a request for, for families to say that was what they wish to do. Uh, as of today, we have about 225 families, or kids, students, so it's certainly less families, K-12, 225 of 3,400 kids that are not planning on attending in person. So we're, uh, we, what we've decided to do, because the numbers are fairly low, uh, we are going to be incorporating those students into the hybrid model, most likely. Um, that's the vision we have today, and we're talking more about that as the numbers solidify this week and into next week. Uh, these is, this is a high-level version of our very minimal. This is the minimum list. There'll be more um, health and safety practices going on. All kids and staff will have face coverings. The state had said the younger kids didn't need to have them. It could be recommended. We've taken a more conservative approach. So all kids will have face coverings at all times. They will be given mask breaks. And of course, lunch will um, allow for the mask to come off in a safe way. 
Um, we went with a six foot minimum. The state had given us a range of three to six. We've maintained a conservative six feet. Um, the principals are reworking all the hallway travel, arrival and dismissal, common space usage. We will have regular hand washing and sanitizing um, throughout the school at regular intervals. Um, in the elementary school, we're able to say kids are really in cohorts because they go to their classroom and stay in their classroom. We're going to be looking at assigned seating as much as possible, uh, especially in the secondary settings. Before school opens, we'll be asking parents and students to sign contracts that'll have both the health and, health and safety expectations as well as expectations for remote learning and what online appropriateness is. Um, it's gonna be a pretty in-depth document as time goes by, we're adding more. In terms of screenings, uh, the staff will be completing a, an electronic um, app, which is really a Google form where you're asked to go through the list of COVID related symptoms. And if you say yes to any of them, you are to stay home. Um, the state, DESE has given us guidance that uh, if you have like some of the really common ones, especially the runny nose is the one we use the most. If you're congested or a runny nose, you, can, you have to have a second symptom and you can allow, still go to work because so many things overlap that. Um, we're working on the same approach for the families at minimum, they will be given a list of those symptoms and be expected to do a self-screening process and to keep kids home if any of those symptoms exist. Um, we are working on developing an electronic version, hopefully also. Um, we're working with, very closely working with Susan Rask and the public health nurse in terms of protocols for both symptomatic students and staff, as well as should we have a COVID case. Um, those are getting tightened up and worked out even as we speak. I'll be bringing some ideas to the school committee tomorrow night. Really, essentially, if there's a COVID case, we turn it over to the health Board of Health office and they tell us what to do um, and they work on the contact tracing and, and such. We, are work we had a consultant in last week to review all of the HVAC systems in the school and we're expecting that report tomorrow um, and we will do any recommended upgrades to the systems. We're going to be having regular air monitoring throughout um, the school year so that we have data to work with and can consistently know if um, we're in good shape there, if there's things we need to change. Transportation, I mean, I'm gonna just show you the, the dates of some of these guidelines coming out of DESTI has proven to be a, a challenge a little bit. So this we got just a couple of weeks ago. DESTI's giving us a guideline of one student per seat, which um, is about a third of our normal capacity. We had done a soft survey almost a month ago and I just put out over the weekend a actual waiver so families can give up their bus seats from September to December and assist us with transportation. Um, in two days, I have a thousand students who are able to be transported uh, through their families. So that's a huge resource for us. We're very fortunate to have that available as a way to get kids to school. Obviously, that gives us a lot of work to do with logistics at the school buildings and traffic and all of that. The, we're working directly with DPW and the Concord Police and really strategizing how to make that effective. Um, all of those processes have to change anyway. Parents can't get out of the car and all these other things that we used to do had to change. So we're reinventing all of that. Um, we'll be, then be redistributing, re, redistributing the routes for the kids who will be riding the buses. Um, the hope which looks like it's coming to fruition will be that we'll be to, able to reallocate and redistribute. That would include Boston where we need a couple of extra runs. So those kids are spread out adequately. The rules on the bus will be that you have to wear your mask at all times. You will have assigned seats. The windows need to be open and we're dry, training drivers and developing strict sanitation protocols. Food service will look completely different. Uh, we are creating a contactless ordering and payment system. Um, we're going to be distributing the food differently. Uh, the kids will be seated differently at the high school and middle school. There'll be some use of, of common spaces. We're bringing desks into cafeterias, um, so there's no temptation to get too close if you're sitting at a cafeteria table. We are going to make sure food's available, uh, especially at the elementary schools where we're not actually serving lunch. We're going to make sure there's a, a bag lunch that can go, especially with our free and reduced populations. We need to maintain all of the normal uh, rules. The meals will be packaged and streamlined, all pre-made, grab and go kind of um, mode. 
my food service manager likes me to say that they're still delicious, even though they're not what we normally would be serving. Um, and we have a very strict cleaning protocols there as well. The minimum list of uh, cleaning throughout the schools, again, minimum list, uh, common spaces will be wiped down multiple times per day. We've purchased electrostatic sprayers so we can disinfect efficiently and effectively at night. At the upper grades, the kids will be wiping desks as they come and go, um, as they leave and come through the transitions between periods, um, readily and easily available throughout classrooms and throughout the buildings, uh, wipes and sanitizers. Restrooms will be clean multiple times a day and we're only using paper towels. There are no hand drying machines on. Um, this one is probably worth noting, especially in this environment, because we enjoy sharing the school facilities with the community, and that's about to change pretty dramatically. Um, we do have field usage going on right now. Any, some youth sports groups are using it as approved through phase three of the governor's plan. They've submitted safe practices to us and safety plans. However, any indoor space is just not going to be available once school opens. Um, so that's a big change and one we are gonna continue to start sending the message on. Visitors at all will not be allowed and that includes the parent population. So all of our normal benefits and real support gets really dramatically changed. Um, meetings that we have to have, Zoom's not going away is really the bottom line there. We'll be still engaging highly with the community and parents through electronic virtual means, even simple things like nurse pickup. And if the lunch is forgotten, we have, we're building, putting in boxes outside the door so the parent can just drop it and go and not enter the school. Just high level of teaching and learning, we've built a really rich list of opportunities electronically. Um, most of this evolved as the spring went on because we knew we were gonna have to be ready for the fall. Um, we're anchoring kids in Google Classroom and for the younger grades, a more developmentally appropriate version of that is uh, Seesaw. We're giving lots of tools that are both content-based and for intervention purposes. Inquiry-based tools, these are ones where kids are researching like Discovery. Um, Overdrive is uh, the same as the public library has for all of its electronic book access. So kids are able to now access all sorts of books without needing a hard copy. We're using tools for assessment, both electronic tools and trying to really um, encourage teachers to use a lot of alternate kinds of activities. Doesn't mean the traditional test is going away. In fact, it's coming back in a way that it had dropped off in the spring, but having a range is a very valuable piece. We're creating what we're calling learning luggage. We're um, wanting kids to have an individual set of materials that they may need. Um, we thought we were building it for the remote environment because one of our challenges in the spring was not knowing what kids had available at home and not being able to assume that certain things were in the house. Um, so we initially built it for that and now we're realizing it's really helpful to have that um, also in the hybrid mode because that minimizes the need for kids to share things. And if they're gonna share it all, we have a lot of cleaning to do. So minimizing that is really important. Grades and attendance are back the way they were. Um, that is a huge change. We did not traditionally grade in the spring. So we will be back to the modes that we're normally in. Um, attendance will be mandated. In fact, I heard from the state today, they're gonna be asking us not just present and absent like before, but they're gonna wanna know whether the student is in a hybrid day at home or remote and if they're present in terms of both the mode they're in and and active actively engaged so they're going to collect data from us um, in a pretty specific way we've been maintaining cultural activities and traditions we did some of this this spring and we want to continue to do that um, field trips we're not leaving the schools but we are signing on for virtual field trips and um, as well as some of the traditions we've had, like releasing the turtles in grade four is one of our beloved traditions. And we did it last spring. We just weren't all there to see it firsthand. Um, cultural competency, equity, and anti-racism are high priorities on our list. We had work already started there. And now um, there's a really new energy there, given the events of uh, June and since, that I think we're I'm really excited to see change happen. We're having really open, authentic, honest conversations about racism in the schools and the work to be done. And I'm gonna just give a shout out to some of the kids at the high school who are part of a club there that's been hosting both uh, radio shows and other opportunities for discussion and 
hearing from them what it's like to be a student of color in our schools is um, painful and powerful both and very important that they're feeling safe to share that with us. So we're pleased by that, more to come on that. Special education, we are going back to direct service in all models. We need to meet the goals of individual plans and aim to make progress toward those goals in a um, way that we weren't able to do in the spring. Uh, that's all back the way it normally is. I mentioned the balanced approach, social emotional needs, relationship and connections, and I don't think we could stress enough our goal for that as the school year starts, regardless of whether the child's in front of us or at home. Um, routine, support, safety, joy. I'm so glad Joy finally made it back to our slides here because somewhere we're gonna make this be an enjoyable experience. We know we're doing it in a different way, but that's the goal. Um, we do have formal social emotional curricula at each developmental age, and we will be doing emotional, social emotional screenings, which we were doing before, uh, but that'll be a formal way to identify kids with particular needs and intervene at an individual level. Extracurriculars and athletics, we are committed to offering as many opportunities for kids as we possibly can. We're waiting for MIAA to decide its approach to the fall season um, for sports. And right now they have said nothing would happen earlier than September 14th. That is going to drive much of what we do for athletics for sure. Um, and I'm gonna give the school committee an update there tomorrow. There's even ideas of moving seasons around so that the allowed sports might have a season in the fall and some of the not allowed sports would move to the spring. So for example, as to how big of a deal that is football happening in the spring instead of the fall, baseball happening in the fall when they miss their season. So we're waiting on a lot of information. We do need to modify and uh, alter music and theater opportunities. We're just as committed to that. Desi has told us that we are not allowed to have um, any singing or wood based, uh, wind based musical instruments in the school at any time soon, so that's a huge impact to those programs. Those teachers are getting creative. The theater teacher is also getting creative. She did so last spring when the musical was canceled, so we know there'll be more to come. Clearly, some of this will have to happen remotely. Um, we're hoping for some in person as well. More to come on all of that. And then we've just done a, round, a lot of information sessions, and those are just in the beginning stages, more and more to come. We met with parents at every level last week. And we're going to continue to share reports on um, emails. We have a reopening web page actually up now on the school web page. And the entire reopening plan um, in its 42 pages is available there for anyone who wants to read it. And following in the next few weeks will be a COVID handbook that each building will release. So we're uh, pretty busy to say the least. Um, we're managing, I think, too, to really want to be responsive to the wide range of uh, emotion and uh, health concerns that go with this and really trying to be responsive to the lis listening to the needs of the staff and their own health concerns and listening to the needs of families and their educational concerns and trying to find the plan that meets, meets everyone's needs in a really fluid environment. So. So that's the high level view. I'm happy to take questions um, and to let you know what I don't know yet and share what I do. Linda. Um, this is so impressive, all the planning and uh, I just can't imagine all the contingencies and the timing of some of this information that you're coping with. Um, you mentioned that parents have opted out and you know, albeit it's a relatively small group compared to the whole, do teachers have the same option? Yeah, actually, last week I uh, was able to work with the uh, school committee and teachers associations to offer the secondary level teachers primarily. It's really hard to give remote options to the elementary teachers, but we're, we're actually going to experiment um, and I think succeed with some remote teaching where the teacher um, is zooming into the classroom and there's some supervision there. So we've also tried to give teachers a wide range of options depending on their own personal needs. Um, I'd be the first to say I'm a little out of the box on this and not many of my colleagues are trying this at this point, but I'm, I'm committed to trying to make this the best environment we can for everybody and we have such great teaching staff that um, to try to build a bank of long-term subs didn't seem like the best option. So. so I assume you don't yet know what that will look like in terms of numbers? No, it's still a moving piece. We're, we're gathering that all as we work with the this, this staff right now. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yes, thank you to to you, Lori, and your whole team for a tremendous amount of work. I know it's taken up a lot of your time and we all appreciate it. Um, my question was, so the parents who are opting out, families who are opting out, those children will be totally remote learners. Is that correct? They will be, they will be. And we're trying to build that fluidly. And we've had a lot of questions from families that, um, you know, if they, if they come to school and change their mind, can they go remote? If they start remote, can they change their mind? So we're, we're really trying to build that with a fluidity that families can decide what works best for them. The other part of why we're building that so fluid, fluidly, uh, because we expect kids who have symptoms need to be home and we wanna make sure that that's um, a very easy transition for them to make. Um, and then if they are in a close contact or quarantined or ill, we also want to be sure that they can do it as much as two weeks at a time individually. So um, lots to figure out there, but that's coming together. Wow, thank you. Uh, Jane. Thanks, Mike. And um, it's surprising given the fact that uh, sometimes I feel like there's very little um, uh, lack of blending between committees in my house given uh, <laughs> given our quarantine, but I try and be respectful and I do have my own questions. Um, this may or may not be relevant, but um, as a parent of uh, college, there are a number of college age uh, students who are opting out completely. who are just not going to school this year. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you're seeing, and I realize it's different in a public school environment and it's different in terms of the regulation, but I'm wondering if there's any um, uh, sense of that yeah. going into the, into the year. It's very anecdotal right now, and I would say very pretty small numbers, but what we know across districts is we're seeing of some families choose to just homeschool, mm -hmm. which removes us from the equation. Um, I believe the private schools are building waiting lists for some of what you just said. Um, and so we're going to keep an eye on that. We're trying to be supportive of whatever families select at this point. Um, the, the hybrid piece with the two days in it is very, very challenging for child care. That's another thing I'm actually working with our own staff on because if their own kids are home, it's a really big challenge. So we're, we're trying to be a supporter. I, I wouldn't say there's big, huge numbers of that happening right now, but there's I'm not suggesting it's a good idea. I'm just... Yeah. Yeah, I, so... And that leads me to my second half, which is, are you working with our local private schools? I mean, Concord does have a, a significant yep. number. And I'm wondering if, I, maybe Mike, we're gonna hear from them at a different date or, yeah. okay, thank you. Yeah, I actually am working with them. We all were on a meeting 10 days ago with uh, Susan Rask and uh, the public health nurse. And a lot of that conversation does equate across school settings of you know the the thing burning on all of our minds is how do you know when to stay open and closed and that translates public and private and to do it at a community level just made a lot of good sense so um we are talking regularly and blurring those lines a little bit because we have a lot more in common than not so yes. uh, uh, terry i don't really have any questions but just it's amount of work is just daunting and the amount of creativity that you've already shown and that you're willing to show going forward to keep this fluidity it's just staggering so thank you so much thanks i will pass that along it's been a huge group effort uh, i have a couple quick, very quick questions one unless i missed it what's the start date yeah so we've actually just modified that as well the commissioner last week, I don't know, it all blurs together. Last week, the commissioner lowered the requirement of 180 days to 170 days for this year. The intent of that was to give us more startup time with staff before the kids re-entered. Um, so we, the school committee approved a calendar last week that our staff would return on August 27th. Our kids will return on a virtual day on September 8th. On the 9th, the K-5 kids will come in in person, and on the 10th, we'll have all of, all, which I'll put in quotes because it's really the hybrid model of half of, the, half of them, um, on September 10th, Thursday the 10th. Right. And the, uh, 
the, the, I know the commissioner just changed the number of days, as you just mentioned. What's the arithmetic for you? I mean, uh, yeah. in your hybrid model is... Uh, they all count for school days. So as long as we're offering the full range of instructional programming at a... We still have an hourly requirement, but it's a little bit lower to compensate for the 10 days. So we still have to account for the number of hours of instruction to kids. We're just now allowed, rightfully, to say that the remote time also counts. Um, so that's that's all the accounting that we need to be doing. The good news is there'll never be a snow day again because we'll be able to say we're remote learning and that'll never be an issue. So we, I'm looking for silver linings where I can find them. <laughs> Steven, Steven, did I have to see your hand? Yeah, I just wanted, I, I, I had noted, I think, I don't know if I said it in this space in the past, but I've said um, certainly to town, so to my, co my colleagues, that nothing that, that I've had to manage um, is as complicated as what uh, Dr. Hunter has to contend with, and all superintendents have to contend with the reopening of schools. And so um, I, I just want to commend her for the, for the excellent presentation. And, and obviously we're here to support town government is here to support the schools in any way we can as this starts to, un to unfold. Thank you. Thank you. I feel that all the time. We're very well supported from every direction. Well, again, thank you very much for coming and for the presentation. And we certainly wish you the very best as you launch this, what will be an amazing school year for all Congress uh, children and teachers and staff at our school. So thank you very much, Dr. Hunter. Thanks for having me. Have a good night. Thank you. Now, the next item on our agenda is a continued public hearing regarding the library agreement. So, Madam Clerk, if you would uh, get us started. Yep. Move to open the public hearing for the library agreement. Uh, the public hearing continued from our meeting on August 3rd. Is there a second? second? Would the clerk please call the roll? Second. Ms. Ackerman? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. Ms. Hotchkiss? Aye. Mr. Lawson? Aye. Myself, Ms. Escobedo, aye. I note that it passes unanimously, and uh, I see that uh, uh, Mario and Sherry are with us again this evening. Thank you for joining us. Uh, at our last public hearing, we went through a number of proposed changes and heard from a number of citizens um, we continue to make uh, uh, some additional changes. Uh, we heard uh, uh, last time from Mr. Perry and uh, Tanya Glass uh, with some additional remarks. And then uh, the one issue that was outstanding uh, from our public hearing was the issue that was raised by uh, Ms. Pardry uh, with respect to uh, an ethics concern for the uh, curator and the library director. And as I mentioned at our last meeting, I had sent this off to town council. And uh, I wrote a memorandum to the select board today and have it uh, posted as part of the package as well. But I think I'm going to uh, at least read uh, the town council's response. So. My memorandum goes like this. As you know, after hearing the concerns raised about a possible ethics issue in the library agreement, I forwarded the issue and the agreement to town council. He responded this morning. So let me read it's just a paragraph response. With respect to the question regarding the conflict of interest laws, the agreement makes clear that fundraising is a primary responsibility of the corporation and the director has a duty to engage in these fundraising activities underlining only to the extent of the director's general responsibility set by the town as described in the agreement. I have further clarified, I have clarified this further in the agreement as suggested by my comments and I'll go over those in a moment. We also outlined the conditions that render town employees participation in the library fundraising permissible in the quote guide to fundraising for town employees unquote that my colleague Sam and I prepared earlier this year. You will see those conditions in the highlighted language on page three of that document. So he suggested some particular language changes to section four of the library agreement. Uh, and essentially 
in that section, he makes it clear, and I'm going to read it, that the library director shall, and then this is the remark that he has entered, to the extent consistent with the library director's duty as, as established by the town, then going back to the original agreement, support the functions of the corporation and the policies and procedures related to its area of responsibilities. So he made that suggestion. And then to a collateral suggestion, as you might recall in outlining the specific duties of the library director, one of those was support the corporation's activities and responsibilities. And with the proposed language that I just read to you, uh, town council suggested that that, uh, that specific duty no longer needed to be stated specifically. So after receiving this and developing this memorandum, I did send this off to our friends, uh, Sherry and Mario from the Library Corporation to determine if they had any concerns about this and both of them responded that they did not. So I think with that, uh, response from town council which i must say i have not yet incorporated into the library agreement i did not want to do that until after we'd had a chance to discuss this and had a chance to share these proposed changes with the uh, library corporation jane um i didn't receive that memo i'm not quite sure did others i haven't seen it i guess it was sent out um, this afternoon it didn't it didn't come into my in inbox Linda you're shaking your head correct I didn't receive it either Jeremy I are did. you on the call yes it went out okay. at I got it at three o'clock and I sent it out at about 310 um, so I don't know if it was just you have checked your email since then or I'm not sure yeah I'm, I'm on my email and it nothing's in there and I've had I've had pieces come in from the town since then well, it's posted on the, on the updated packet online. Um, and I could try sending it again for the board to have, but it's posted online. Terry, did I see your hand? I, oh, I, I'm just saying I did receive it. Yeah. And yeah. Susan, I think, said she did receive yes. it as well. Mm -hmm. Well, it was uh, not. I, I, I don't know whether Jeremy copied you on that or not, Stephen. I'm sorry. Uh, the, the extent of the change to the uh, uh, library agreement is just that parenthetical insertion that says to the extent consistent with the library director's duties as established by the town. So if that wasn't received, I think what I would like to propose that we do is the following. Then. You've had a chance to review all of the other uh, proposed changes as outlined in the in my memorandum to you of August 7th. You all got that? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. So what I, after we've had a chance to hear from the public, um, then what I'm gonna suggest we do is decide whether we can accept all of the changes that were proposed in the memorandum of August the 7th. And then what, if we do do that, then what I will do is I will send the revised agreement to town council, you'll recall it. folks were interested that town council review the entire document. He has done it, but I've held off on his particular comments until he sees the final kind of final version so we don't iterate him to death. Um, so I'll send that off uh, to him for his review. I will work with Mario, Stephen, and Sherry to incorporate appropriate suggestions from town council. And then we will uh, come back on, it will have to be August 24th, because it's 17th, as you recall, is a public hearing to approve the complete, to approve the complete document. So is that clear what at least my intent is, whether you go along with it or not, your issue. But so does anybody on the board, before we turn to the public, have concerns about any of the proposed changes that were outlined and articulated in my memorandum of August 7th. Jane? I also didn't receive that from you. 
this. I'm, I'm confused. I, I don't have anything from you. I mean, I have a number of other things on the 7th, but not that. What about the rest of the board members? So um, I, read, I read changes in the um, packet is where I saw them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It, it didn't come on the 7th, Jane. It's, um, it's in the packet. It came on the packet. Okay. All right, so uh, we have a lot of people on the call. Uh, so this is a public hearing. I want to turn to the public. First, I want to ask uh, Sherry and Mario if you have uh, any comments you would like to make. You don't need to, but asking you to do. And I don't see. No, no. Okay. I don't think so. And Thank Mario, you. Mario looks still muted, so I'll presume that means he, he doesn't. All right. So again, my screen can only see a certain number of people, so I'm going to turn to the public and ask if there are any comments. Uh, please unmute yourself and say your name, and then we'll try to keep it from becoming crazy. Jean, your hand is up. Why don't you go first? Thank you. Jean Goldsberry, 1832 Main Street, and the former chair of the former Public-Private Partnership Study Committee. Seems like the committee that will just never die. Um, I, I'm wondering, given that you will, again, have another couple of weeks, if the MOU might be completed in that amount of time. Stephen? Uh, I I would love to say yes, but I don't think that's possible. Okay. Um, do you have another comment, Jane, or is that? Well, I, if the MOU is not completed and is not part of the, um, the agreement, um, according to the Public-Private Partnership Study Committee's recommendation and the select board's adopted policy back in 2007, they call for a, an open public hearing when any kind of change happens to an existing agreement. So it will really be imperative that the next select board um, ensure, commit and ensure that an open public meeting happens to discuss the MOU so that the, the continuation of openness and transparency takes place. Thank you. Um, is, is there someone else who wishes to speak? Please say your name. And Ned, I see your hand, so please go ahead. Identify yourself. Ned Perry, 362 Bedford Street. Winston, Chir Winston Churchill once said, the farther back you look, the further forward you can likely see. The present draft agreement has not been fully vetted through either the select board P3 policy dated July 10, 2017, nor does it take into account the issues contained in the town governance study committee dated 20, August 24, 2014. I believe it is unfortunate that the town has given the Library Corporation more involvement in the administration of the library rather than maintain it into the traditional role of owning and maintaining the library buildings. Unfortunately, the present proposed agreement confuses rather than clarifies who the library staff is working for. I wish all the parties well with the administration of this library uh, uh, under this agreement. And thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Barry. Uh, is there someone else who wishes to speak? Again, I can only see 25 of the 50 people on the call, so you just need to unmute yourself and say your name. All right, hearing no one, I would entertain a motion to close a public hearing. Move to close the public hearing. Second. Or second. Second. Is there any further discussion by the select board? All right, would the court please call the roll? Um, Ms. Ackerman. Aye. Ms. Bates. Aye. Ms. Hotchkiss. Aye. Mr. Lawson. Aye. Myself, Ms. Escobedo. Aye. Thank you, and I know it passes unanimously. All right, folks, what do you, what is your uh, pleasure? So again, let me propose that what I'm suggesting is that we adopt 
uh, the changes that are contained in a memorandum dated August the 7th, which is uh, was contained in your packet. And then subsequent to that, I will make uh, all of these changes to the document and I will forward it along uh, to town council. He will respond with suggestions for change, which I will share with Sherry and Mario. I will develop a similar memorandum with a marked up copy of the agreement and bring it back to the select board on August 24th. Yes, Linda. So I, I just have a question about um, why we wouldn't look at this in its entirety uh, as we, uh, you know, give our final blessing to it, so to speak. What do you mean by in our and so as opposed to do you know a a, a, a voting in the affirmative on um, the changes that we've seen made to date um, and then waiting for this second step that you've outlined. So your suggestion was we just close the public hearing and we do what I said. And then when we get the information back from council, uh, we make those changes and come back to the board on the 24th. Is that the idea? Um, I'm, a I'm, actually, uh, I'm actually suggesting that we close the public hearing. You um, proceed on the steps that you outlined. And then when we come back on the 24th, we ratify the entire agreement in its entirety. Um, it's absolutely fine with me. The purpose of my suggestion was there were a lot of changes that we had already made and seemingly agreed to. I would like to get those into the agreement so that when council looks at it, he has as near a final version of it as possible. I'm trying to avoid, you know, going back and forth and running up the, the money on town council looking at a variety of different uh, versions of this. So I, but I'm happy to do it, Terry. I, I see some merit in that. Okay. Right. I think um, we could probably um, strike a balance between both of those approaches. Um, I think, Mike, you have incorporated pretty much all of the concerns from all of the various groups uh, really well. And um, Right now, I, I don't see any additional changes. I guess I want to hear from uh, my colleagues here, but we can kind of see if there's a consensus whether anything else needs to be changed. And if not, then we can do what you're suggesting, Mike. Send right. to council and then take our formal vote in a few weeks. And that would also accomplish what Mr. Perry wants, which is maybe a few more weeks for the community to have more input if there's anything needed or some more vetting or, you know, so if anything comes up between now and then from council or the public, we'll still have an opportunity on the 24th before we take our final vote. All right. Jane? I was just going to say, I mean, it seems to me that, you know, approving the, the memorandum as written on the 7th is, you know, approving the, the decision or the, um, the agreements uh, we had made at that point, and it doesn't affect it until we sign off on the on the agreement itself, the legal mm -hmm. um, agreement between the the library and the and the town. So we we've reserved that. Nothing has been set in stone on that level. Susan, do you have a? Yeah, I, I agree with that. That I think we can go ahead and um, approve the changes in the August seventh memo. And then uh, after the you incorporate the response from town council about the responsibilities of the library director, um, then that'll you know we'll review it again on the 24th. But but as Jane said, we'll have an option to um, um, change if it's indicated. No, we're not. Uh, the suggestion was not to approve the document. Uh, 
the uh, well, to have you go ahead and incorporate the changes in the August 7th memo, is that? Well, that's just the point. We'd have a motion to incorporate the changes in the August 7th memorandum into the library agreement. Yeah. And that's something that uh, the, the library corporation and representatives have already agreed to. So um, I think it moves us ahead a little bit mm -hmm. and gives Mina uh, a cleaner copy to sort of work from. So that's the idea. Yeah, I, that sounds reasonable to me. All right, uh, Linda, you were? Ready to make a motion? Well, you were the one who was not, I think, exactly thrilled with that. So I'm no, I, I think I think as it's presented now and clarified, um, I'm comfortable with it. All right then, I would entertain a motion. Okay, um, move to uh, uh, incorporate the uh, changes to the library agreement as outlined in the August seventh uh, memorandum. Is there a second. Second. I, I think I saw a hand go up uh, from the audience. Jean, did you want to uh, say something? You're, you're muted. If you approve the, the, um, the agreement now, and then there are changes to the agreement based on, on town council's comments on what you're going to send him, um, aren't, aren't you creating more work for yourself by then having to have another public hearing? We're not, we're not, um, we're not approving the agreement or approving a set of changes so that the agreement we can send to council is one that we've all agreed to, and then he can weigh in with council's perspective on this. I'm sure he'll have some lawyer things that you want to do, but we're not approving the agreement. So you're not approving the agreement tonight? No, we are approving the set of changes outlined in my memorandum to the select okay. board dated August 7th, and that's it. Thank you for the clarification. You're certainly welcome. Would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Ackerman? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. Um, Ms. Hotchkiss? Aye. Mr. Lawson? Aye. Myself, Ms. Escobedo, aye. Thank you. I know it passes unanimously. Um, I will make these changes uh, from the August 7th memorandum and send it to town council. And as soon as we have it back from town council, I'll share it with our friends at the Library Corporation, and uh, then I'll get it posted as soon as I can so everybody has a chance to look at it. Terry? That sounds great. And I also wanted to comment that um, I, I want to thank Jean for bringing up um, that you said, Jean, that it's imperative that we honor the public private partnership process when we do have an MOU in the future. And I, I'm, I know I'm committed. I think we're all committed to having that public hearing at that time. Thank you. Are there any other comments about this uh, agenda item? So again, I want to thank Mario and Sherry in particular for working very hard over this last couple of weeks to make progress on that. And I'll look forward to seeing you both back here on August 24th. So thank you. The next item on our agenda is the White Pine White Pond Advisory Committee recommendations. And who is here from White Pond to get us going on this? Carmen, if, you, if it's you, you have to unmute yourself. Okay. Not yet. There you go. How's that? Is that Judith? <laughs> Thank you. Please identify yourself for the record. Carmen Jacquier, 38 Shore Drive, White Pond Advisory Committee. Um, thank you for having us to your meeting. And I'm going to start with talking about the watershed and just giving a few facts about it. We all know that White Pond is a kettle pond and the only source of water for kettle ponds is what falls on it or what filters through the watershed. And the watershed is what contributes to the health of the pond. The soil in the watershed can filter pollutants out, but if there are pollutants in the soil, it can also carry them in. 
water, White Pond's watershed is very undersized. It's, it's two to one ratio of watershed to pond. Other ponds have like 20 to one or 30 to one. The Mississippi River has about a 35 or 31 states plus some provinces of Canada. And small uh, watersheds always feed larger watersheds. And we, White Pond feeds into the Sudbury River. So it's into that, goes into that watershed. Um, a Walden Pond, which is 60 acres, has a three to one watershed and their watershed is mostly forested and undeveloped um, with established trees with good deep root systems that can really carry the water down. White Pond, besides being undersized, also has some challenges. Um, I'm going to use some numbers now, and these numbers are from the ESS report of 2014 to the town. And just for the ease of listening, if a number is like 39.4, I'm going to say 40, just to, to round it up to make it sound. There's nothing that's more than six points going, point six going up. So the acreage of the pond is approximately 40 um, acres. It's just a hair under that. The watershed, 114 acres. Those 114 acres contain 12 acres of farm fields, 24 acres residential, and 78 acres other. And those 114 acres contain 110 parcels of all different sizes. Of those, 83 are developed and 27 undeveloped. So besides being an undersized watershed, the majority of the watershed has development on it. Um, developed means it's, it's like a three to one ratio of developed to undeveloped. The developed in, includes 80 plus homes, paved driveways, parking strips, 15 roads, the boat launch, and the parking lot of the beach. Now homes with gutters and drain pipes will put some precipitation back into the watershed, but impermeable surfaces like those paved surfaces don't. They block water, it runs off. When it runs off, it can carry contaminants or pollutants that could be on that surface. So the, the 114 acre watershed has less acreage than that that is open for full absorption. Now about 80 plus homes in the watershed are all on septic systems. In a talk that Susan Rask gave to our committee a couple years ago, she emphasized that no matter how well a homeowner manages their septic system, no matter how absorbing our sandy soil is, everything that goes down will eventually go into the pond. Because in the watershed, all fluid, all precipitation goes to the same place, the lowest point. Now, ESS concluded that the septic systems were not the main nitrogen load. Um, they said it was groundwater, which of course can come from other sources. So the septic systems are another challenge to the, to the watershed. They did, ESS did conclude that 71% of the phosphorus load in the pond was from runoff and erosion. And we know phosphorus feeds algae. Nitrogen can also feed some algae. They found the phosphorus in the stormwater coming down the boat launch, overflowing the catch basins was excessive. The amount of phosphorus there was excessive. But they concluded in the report that the phosphorus load in White Pond was a permissible load, at least in 2014, and was, end quote, was therefore unlikely to result in frequent algae blooms or poor water clarity during the growing season, close quote. The next year, 2015, the pond was closed for the season with constant recurring algae blooms that covered the majority area of the pond. And it continued, it continued on for months. It was a, a season where you really, you got a couple weeks in spring and a couple weeks in the fall that it was clear enough and okay to swim. 
Now the two prominent cyanobacteria algae that year and every year since until this year are phosphorus based ones. This year, the main algae, and I've hardly seen any of those other two, the main algae is microcystis. It is uh, nitrogen based. And the thing is we're not alone. All across New England, all water bodies are seeing blooms with just microcystis. And the, the reason is unknown. I've asked, I've talked to Hillary at EPA and they've talked with Professor Haney, University of New Hampshire. It's some kind of phenomenon in New England this year. Blooms are all microcystis. Unfortunately, microcystis can have, has higher toxicity than our usual two Dolichosperum and Warrenichinia. They're, so the numbers for the microcystis blooms have not been very high, but it doesn't matter. The toxicity is a little higher. So ESS recommended a managed approach to White Pond that addressed current and potential future sources of phosphorus to ensure the load would remain below the permissible level. They noted the phosphorus runoff. They said it, the phosphorus was mainly from runoff and they noted that the erosion along the shore at Sachem's End um, was one of the main causes. Now the town has done a wonderful job of repairing and rebuilding. And last year we had fewer blooms than normal. And I put that down to that erosion control job really stopping. I mean, they rebuilt stairs, they planted green cover, which had been bare soil. They put up um, fences of different kinds to keep people off. And I think that helped us last year. Mm -hmm. um, this year, We've had few blooms, they've been small, they've been quick, but the majority have been towards White End Avenue down towards the other end of the pond, towards Sachem. Now they also noted in the report the illegal swimming at Sachem's, and they thought with no facilities possible, besides causing erosion, that that could add to the phosphorus load. But they didn't think that the current number of swimmers during it for a day would likely exceed 50 and therefore it was not gonna be a problem. Currently and for some years, there are over a hundred swimmers plus dogs seen at one time at Sachem's End and that is not the total for the day. That is just at one time. It's social media. It's out on social media. You can come there, you can swim. There's nobody around to, to do anything. Um, ESS also warned about the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail adding to swimmers at that end, that people on the trail would see the pond, and if they didn't come off their bikes then, and they might come off, their, come off with their bikes and come down the hills causing erosion, they might come back another time and say, hey, that's a great place to swim. The White Pond Committee warned the town about that, that that was going to be a problem with the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail, and we have about two years till that trail comes through. But people are already coming up to Powder Mill on the finished part and then coming down to the pond from the trail. They recommended a management program to stabilize erosion areas, manage public access, and manage town lands to reduce any sediment and nutrient loading. And that's why our committee most urgently recommends that all open areas within the watershed be managed and protected so they do not contribute to nutrient loading to the watershed and the pond. So that's um, all I have to say about um, the watershed and I'll take any questions and Cheryl Baggin will continue on to the next topic. No questions? Okay. That's not Cheryl, please. Go okay, on. Cheryl. Excuse me. Uh, Linda has a question. Yeah, uh, just uh, some quick questions. Um, you know, what is your evidence for the fact that the increased traffic is from the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail? Mm -hmm. Is one question I have. Oh well, people have seen it. People have seen the people coming down. There's people that swim every day in the pond down there, but actually, a lot of I think the, still the main part of the traffic is coming in on Dover. They're parking on Anson Alden, as they've done for years, and they're walking in on Dover. We see 
uh, you'll see a group of families with 20 people with coolers and towels coming in. They also will drive in, drop off people at the end on Varick down there after you come down off Dover and drive out to park, drive in to pick them up, drive out to leave. And they will go 40 miles an hour. And then the other uh, related question to this is, the, the um, this problem <coughs> problems that you're citing is this um, outside of the hours when the beach is operating. Well, the blooms come up during the day because the sun activates them. It's for the people uh, management I'm, issue I'm talking oh, about. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? Then I didn't understand it. Um, the observations or anecdotal information in terms of the number of people that are near Sacton Cove swimming and so forth, the extra parking and so forth, is that happening during the um, public hours when the beach is uh, being managed by the town? Or outside? Yes, the, the majority of people are there in the daytime. Sometimes people have come at night, they make fires, they leave trash and stuff. But yes, it's usually, it's during the day. And those numbers um, are actual people who live on the pond and they're looking down there and they're counting people and dogs. And they'll say it's 100, it's 106, it's 110 on this day at this time. Multiple people have made counts. All right, thank you. Any other questions from the board? Seeing none, Cheryl. Okay, um, can you hear me? We can hear you. Right. Okay. So um, I am just going to go through uh, the written uh, recommendations that we uh, forwarded to presented to you, um, in you know for discussion or whatever. So the first thing that we um, want to talk about are the fields. Um, so when land was gifted to the town and we accepted the gift from White Pond Associates, there were fields that are on Plainfield and Powder Mill Road. There, so two of those parcels are under conservation restriction. And uh, the other one is a sort of um, is earmarked to go with the beach access. And we strongly recommend that those parcels be maintained as passive meadows. So if we're going to limit the amount of nutrients passing through the soil into the town, phosphorus predominantly, um, but also nitrates, uh, we think it would be much better to use as a passive meadow rather than um, any other farming such as row crops, which we they've used uh, the, in the past several years, the farmer has been using row crops, which leaves a lot more exposed soil. And um, any crops, any kind of fertilizers have to be applied to those crops. And if we kept them as passive meadows, it would be consistent with, uh, I, I think I also in there was a site to an EPA recommendations regarding agriculture and water supplies. And in addition, it is consistent with the homeowner's guide that was put out by the ESS group, which Carmen mentioned before, and prepared by the Division of Natural Resources. And in that pamphlet, they ask homeowners to, I'm going to get the exact words here, to reduce or eliminate the use of fertilizers and pesticides. And, um, and they say, and if you are going to fertilize, wait until the fall and not, not fertilize in the spring. Well, of course, that's not what's going to happen if, the, if that area is going to be farmed because there's going to be um, fertilizer will be put on when the crops get put into the soil. The other thing recommended in there to homeowners is to maximize natural growth. So our recommendation to keep those parcels to the extent possible as passive fields would be consistent with the publication issued by ESS and prepared by the Division of Natural Resources and is consistent with the EPA recommendations. Okay. All right. Uh, yep. right. I'm sorry? The next item is the boat launch. Yep. The next recommendation is a boat launch. And my understanding is that there's already an engineering study being um, considered um, by the town and, um, and the state, and they're, and they're working on a way to limit the amount of water that is going to um, be coming down the boat launch. It's a difficult spot because the boat launch, the um, land on either side of the boat launch is owned by the town and the boat launch road itself is state owned. Um, but 
you know, to the extent possible, we know that that's an area that's being worked on, and we recommend that it be considered to be continued to be worked on. Um, and I think the rest of the things have already been. So we uh, again, um, everything that's going to be designed is going to encourage absorption and avoid runoff, and existing basins be cleaned. Those are self-evident. Uh, we recommend that monitoring and testing be continued in the current fashion, and any additional testing would be great as well. Um, and any trash, and then so that then I go to uh, facilities. We have trash receptacles should be maintained in different locations around the pond through three seasons. Um, ESS also mentioned that in their recommendations to the town. Um, we ask, <laughs> this goes right to what Carmen has been just talking about, that we look at surrounding streets regarding parking and maybe consider the town, might consider additional parking restrictions. And um, now that the town is under, with regard to both the Bruce Freeman Trail being opened and now that the beach is under town supervision, and we think the current openings and closing dates set for the beach are wonderful. No, um, and then I think, Carmen discussed town, uh, the people management. Um, we strongly recommend that the um, that the water that the swimming be restricted only to the town beach and any other beaches that are already recognized, and that there be a plan created for people management, clear signage, enforcement of those signs, and um, regulations regarding inflatable devices. Make sure that they're not considered boats. Um, right now that the state allows boating or restricted boating, but boating allowed on the pond. And we wouldn't want people to think that they could just enter from the, um, the ramp with some sort of floating device and consider that a boat. Um, and then we also strongly recommend that ranger program and police controls be continued and maybe um, which I know was difficult this year. And as far as fish stocking, um, Carmen has been in touch with the state regarding that, and they do not seem to be very flexible, but it's something to consider going forward, you know, that we think it's probably being overstocked, um, and that would add to um, the nutrient loading of the pond. And I'll just so, say something, I'm sorry, I'll just say something too about the fishing, that ESS in the report, the percentage of uh, pond available with a cold habitat for fish in 2014. I think they, I believe they said it was down to 16 or 14 percent. It used to be twice that or more. So the, you know, it's it's warming, and we don't really have white pond does not really have a good deep habitat that's cold anymore for the big fish like the rainbow trout that the state stocks. But when I talk to this to um, I think it's John Sheehy at Fish and Game. They do rainbow trout because the other trout are slower to grow and they're smaller and they're a little more um, hard to grow. The rainbow trout grow fast and grow big and that's what fishermen want. But if you have, the thing about rainbow trout is when they're little, they eat zooplankton. When they get bigger, they eat small fish. But at any time, they'll go back and eat zooplankton. That's just how rainbow trout are. Other trout never eat zooplankton, except maybe when they're small. And we need zooplankton because that is the enemy of the cyanobacteria algae. It eats it. And in testing, um, I have a perfect year of 2017 that I can show there's all these zooplankton in May and June. And all of a sudden, there's none. And then we got our blooms. So rainbow trout, I understand why the state does it, but I mean, in, out in the West, some body water, bodies of water that have algae blooms, they forbid rainbow trout to be stocked. And I, I wish this, the state could maybe just stock us with those other. Also for two years, we've had no ice. There's no ice fishermen to take out these fish. And in the morning, I used to look out and I would see 10 fishermen around the pond early in the morning. I see none. So we've been stocked twice. I've seen the stockings, they're big fish. Um, and the fish aren't coming out of the pond. And you can have too many fish and you can have not enough food and then they die and then they're down in the bottom of the pond and they're releasing phosphorus because they're dead. Okay, so. All right, Carmen. 
Uh, Michelle, uh, thank you uh, very much. Um, I know we have a lot of people here that not want to contribute to this. Please. I'm going to first, uh, Steve, before I call on you, I'm just going to ask Here's... if there's any comments from the select board. Or and we to... have one more person. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, we have one more person, Beth Kelly, our newest member. I thought that was the end of the memorandum. I'm sorry, she's talking a little bit more about people management and signage. Okay, who is this now? Oh, Beth? Beth? Beth Kelly. Unmute yourself, Beth, and we can hear you. Still okay. muted. You're still muted, Beth. Still muted, Beth. Okay. It doesn't look like she has a microphone available that she can use on her computer. Beth, if you can hear me, I don't know if you have a, a different device, like a phone or something you can call in on real quick, but it doesn't look like I can unmute you because there's no microphone. Yeah. Well. Well, she was, she was going to talk about the signage. I saw what she was going to say. And she said they already see people coming down from the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail. There's no signage down there. There was signage for no swimming. It gets torn out and thrown up the hill. So, you know, people see on social media, it's great to swim. And they come there and there's no sign saying there's no swimming, you know. Um, and uh, some of the people might not speak English, so we need signs that have the international symbols on them. And we need signs up by the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail, even though it's not open. We just, we need signage and we need enforcement. Um, the Rangers were great, though they also covered a lot of other properties in Concord. I don't think they were here that much the past couple years because the town added more properties like October Farm. Um, and then there was Estabrook. And we're told to call the police, but you know, the police are great and they're very responsive, but they have more important things sometimes they have to get to. It just doesn't seem like the right kind of job for police per se. You know, Rangers, yeah. And I know there was a snafu this year about the money for the Rangers and Delia has been unable to find people to take $15 an hour. So there's, there's no enforcement. There's can you hear oh, me? Beth, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. I, I, can, I can talk a little. Like, just give you some background. Um, and I'm new um, to the board just recently. I live on White Avenue myself. And, um, you know, the number of the people at the Cove and the surrounding shoreline continues to be an issue. Uh, you know, multiple people are doing counts. Um, we see, we've seen dogs swimming constantly. There's evidence of both human and dog feces. Um, the trash is abundant. There are permanent towels and chairs being left behind. Alcohol clearly present and is being left as garbage. And we're also seeing, um, you know, people on their floats, et cetera, drinking. So those are the things that I don't even think are allowed. Um, you know, Saturday, we walk on the rail trail every day. Saturday, we were behind two groups of families, one with a, a, stro a jogging stroller, the rest were on bikes, with their towels and their floats and their fishing rods and they drive right through the underpass for the where the trail ends there's no signage there as um carmen indicated um you know it could even be some kind of a gate i guess but there's no evidence that you shouldn't even be on a bike on the trail and then yesterday we were over uh we were on our kayaks and we saw people coming down into the side of the cove that doesn't even have the stairs so they're clearly using and making paths that we're trying to protect from runoff that the town worked really hard to protect last year. Um, so we're seeing, and there's no signage at those trails either. Um, loud groups, big groups, no social distancing, loud music, kids making rope swings, swinging at the Stone Roof Beach area who don't actually live there. Um, we're having speeding cars down, I guess Dover, it's a real problem. I've seen it myself, I live on White. We have a lot of people drive into White trying to find access. So there's parking problems on both streets too. And I've been told that when the Rangers were here, it was a lot, uh, a, a little better, but right now it's pretty much out of control. And I can also tell you that there's more people in the Cove swimming on a daily basis than at our beach. And that's planned, I think, because they're not allowing so many people in because of social distancing, but there's more people on the Cove than at the beach. And that's a problem. 
Thank you, Beth, very much. Uh, let me ask again if there are questions from the board. Or Jane, I see your hand, and then Terry. Uh, first off, I, um, as the liaison to the White Pond uh, Advisory Committee, I just wanted to thank everybody. Um, this is a, a very impressive committee, um, and the dedication to this resource is, is um, it's a wonderful asset to the town, um, not just White Pond, but the people who, who care about it. And um, I know that, that putting together this, uh, this set of recommendations was a uh, heartfelt and long and long processed uh, effort. And um, I also want to recognize that we've, we as a select board have received a number of letters supporting many of the things that are being talked about. So I just want to thank the White Pond Association for your diligence and um, look forward to hearing what my colleagues have to say. Thank you, Terry. Yes, um, I have a question on um, Cheryl's first recommendation about the fields on Plainfield and Powder Mill being um, passive meadows. Yeah. Um, my question is maybe addressed to Delia, who I think is here. I'm not sure, but um, sure. I have to have a little bit better understanding of what the NRC's position is, and why farming has been allowed in the past, and and what your thinking is on it now. Delia, do you want to respond? Sure, hi everybody. Uh, so- Just for the record. I'm sorry, Delia K, Natural Resources Director for the town. Thanks, Mike. Um, so the NRC was approached by the White Pond Associates in 2018 when the White Pond Associates were looking to gift the land to the town. Um, the farm fields as well as the recreational the beach uh, facility. Um, farming has occurred on that parcel or on those four parcels as they are split out uh, for generations. It was originally part of the Wheeler farm. Um, historically was farmed for row crops. Uh, Steve Verrill, who is on the call can probably give you more detail as to what those crops entail um, but since I've been here in 2006, uh, row crops, one year they were farmed, uh, the chickens were on the fields. Um, when the NRC was approached by the White Pond Associates, they were reluctant to accept a gift um, with restrictions because um, the board initially had asked that farming be discontinued as a use. Um, and the NRC was not really interested in accepting lands with no demonstrated need to continue the use or with any restrictions on it. Um, the land trust, which holds the conservation restriction on the parcel, also felt that same reluctance. And so after you know several discussions, and this is in the NRC minutes, um, the uh, NRC accepted the land with the one restriction that irrigation not be allowed to be, no irrigation well is allowed to be installed on the property. Even though there's evidence of irrigation that was previously conducted on the parcel from old irrigation pipes that are there. And the reason for this is primarily because there was no evidence that the NRC had or anybody could provide that there was a, a concern about or that there was evidence that there was any agricultural inputs that were entering the pond. Um, NRC talked about this at length when they were discussing this with the White Pond Associates and felt if there was any demonstrated evidence of any inputs into the pond that of course they would take the appropriate action. Um, I've met with Steve Verrill who currently and has historically farmed the fields. I've met with Bill Walker who many of you know um, who does not Neither of them believe, and I don't believe that there's any evidence that there's any that is getting from the fields into uh, the pond. So I think about what evidence, you know, how can we, you know, scientifically demonstrate this? Do we, uh, can we figure out if there are some tests that can be conducted to understand if there's agricultural runoff entering the ponds. I know, you know, I've talked with Steve over you know, numbers of years about this field because of the concerns that have been raised over the years. 
Steve hasn't used any fertilizers or any herbicides for a number of years. He put up a berm on one of the fields in the only low area that we thought might be contributing runoff. Um, you know, I, I've never seen any evidence of leaves or anything. The sluice way that is provided by the county, you know, the state access right of way is an entirely different story. That is a major, major contributor to degradation of the pond. And Kate Hodges, who is working on the White Pond Improvements Program, has included that restoration in her project plans, which is tremendous. Yeah. And, you know, I think you all acknowledged, uh, the White Pond Advisory Committee acknowledged the work that the Natural Resources Division has done on the Sachem's Cove improvements. So, you know, we're doing our best, but I, I don't see any evidence that the fields are contributing to the degradation of the pond at this time. Mr. Barrow, did you want to comment on this point? I suspect that's why your hand was up. If you would uh, just unmute yourself and identify yourself for us. Uh, Steve Verrill, Verrill Farm. And I've been farming the land for the last few years. Um, I remember it for longer than that. Um, I conquer it has always had quite a history of agricultural production and farming on great farmland in Concord. Some of it's been high land like that is and some low land like the meadows, but it all adds together to make a good balance of agricultural use. Um, my early memories of that area, uh, there were five homes of year round people on the pond with a total of 14 residents. And if you stood at the entrance to the beach where it comes off a plain field road, you couldn't see a house inside any place. It was all potato field. So, uh, and we went swimming there with no algae. Um, they irrigated all of that land out of the pond. And in listening to this, uh, one of the things I was thinking about that it would draw the uh, water off the surface of the pond, which will be the warm water in the summer. And it did lower the pond a bit, but when the pond recharged, you'll be taking in cool water from down under. And that, that could affect the temperature of the pond some, if that's one of the issues. But uh, um, any fertilizer we use, we uh, have a crop scout we use with a integrated pest management program. Uh, we're certified by the Massachusetts Commonwealth uh, quality program for the state and we try to do things responsible. Uh, any fertilizer we use is just a little dribble goes in from the planter beside the seed and is used right away. I'm appalled at the recommendation that people apply fertilizer in the fall and the plants can't take it up. That doesn't make any sense. But uh, we try to only fertilize a little bit when it's needed, where it's needed. In the last few years, uh, we've grown quite a bit of rye to harvest for uh, seed for cover crops. And one of the reasons we grow that is uh, it will survive with uh, low moisture amounts. Some of the crops, beans and peas, probably you can grow. We have done that before. Um, over the years, the crops have been based on the need and demands of the market. Uh, most of the life of agriculture there has been for wholesale vegetable crops. And in recent years, the wholesale market hasn't been great. And when uh, Alden Wheeler died and we started farming the land, we were dairy farming. We grew alfalfa to feed the cows, but that ceased to be profitable. So now uh, we don't grow alfalfa because there's no need a market for it. And uh, we grow retail vegetables to feed the people in town, and that seems to be a good use for it. And we plant cover crops to uh, cover the soil in the winter. I've spent a number of times visiting during a heavy rain and afterwards with no signs of any runoff from those fields whatsoever. So they're so well drained. 
Uh, phosphorus seems to be the issue. And uh, in agronomy, I learned that phosphorus gets tied up in the soil where it's applied and it moves uh, very little in the soil compared to potash or nitrogen. Um, so I, I just feel there's no risk from the pond or I wouldn't be doing what we're doing. Thank you. I mean, uh, other questions from the select board? All right, are there any other? Can I just, can I just respond to that a little bit? Is that sure. Also, this is Cheryl Baggett. Can I, is that right? Please. Okay, I just want to point out, um, I, again, we, we're not talking about runoff here, and I'm just going to read a little bit here from the EPA, US EPA's uh, suggestions. And I understand that fertilizer, obviously limiting fertilizer just to the amount that's taken up by the plants is obviously ideal. Um, but there is excess nitrogen and phosphorus, generally speaking, with fertilized fields. But it says um, it can uh, high levels of nitrogen and phosphorus can cause eutrophication of water bodies, and excess nitrogen and phosphorus can leach through soils into groundwater over time. It's certainly true that nitrogen uh, moves more quickly through the soils than phosphorus. Um, but Susan Rask said all of it eventually enters into the pond. And not only does it disrupt wildlife, but also produces toxins harmful to humans. And I also point out that the Natural Resources Commission issued something to homeowners asking them to eliminate the use of fertilizers and pesticides and maximize natural growth. So um, I, it's hard to recommend to homeowners that they not use fertilizers if the town is going to, you know, take large parcels of land and apply fertilizers to it. Okay. The, the other Julia? thing, too, is that Excuse me. this is, I'm sorry. Julia, was your hand up? I, I did raise my hand. I, I just wanted, I, I completely, Cheryl, I completely appreciate and respect that um, perspective. Um, I, I think that it just needs to be put a little bit into context when you're talking about the EPA's recommendations. I'm just going to share a screen here with what where that came from if you look to the right hand side of your screen you will see that this is what the epa is talking about this is a a, a tractor with a, a sprayer spraying manure that they this is what they're talking about when they're saying apply the right amount of herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers, whatever. We don't do this here. The farmers in Concord don't do this. So I just think it's important to really be clear on, on what, you know, the, the, the uses of Concord farmers are and what that means for our land and further from the NRC's perspective, farming is one of the four overarching goals of their open space and recreation plan. Promoting farming, local farming, sustainable farming, making sure that this use is maintained as it has been historically and can be continued to be sustainably into the future. I just I think it's really kind of an, an important point to make because I don't, I don't see that the farming that is occurring anywhere in town is the farming that the EPA is saying, you know, just be careful of. Um, and I guess the other point that I would just like to respond to um, <clears throat> is gone. So I'll come back to that later on, sorry. Uh, Carmen, did you have a comment that you wanted to make? I, I did. Um, I think it's great. It's wonderful driving around Concord and seeing all the farms. It's just that this, those fields are part of an undersized watershed. And I don't know that there's other places in Concord farming on a watershed, except maybe the Brigham's on the Sudbury River. But the Sudbury River has a huge watershed. Mm -hmm. um, and that I think that there should be uh, some deference given to a watershed of a pond that the quality of the water has declined 
over the years. They say for, for generations it's been farmed, but we've had climate change during that time. And things that were done okay formerly because of the changes in the weather and the heat, they're not okay now. And, you know, White Pond has suffered blooms every year for the years I, I we've lived here 12 years. There's been blooms every year. I know there's been blooms way back in history too, but I just think that the town should think about doing something a little, I don't know how to say it, a little more uh, giving to the pond, give it, you know, a little more help because land that's left undisturbed has root systems and fungal systems that connect and they help water be absorbed better. All right, thank you. Uh, Susan, did you have a question? Um, um, yes, I did. I remember a couple of years ago, someone came to uh, from the White Pond Association, and, and it may be one of the um, people present tonight to talk about specifically the stocking and about the, the trout not being a good fish, I guess, because of, of what it eats, the zooplankton that are helpful in controlling the, the blooms. Um, is there anything to be done about that? I mean, I'm not sure if the if the state has any flexibility. But the other, my second question is, it seems like um, the increased swimming and deterioration of the, the banks around Sachem's Cove It froze up on us, Susan. And S Brook, the influx. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, okay. It reminds me a little bit of what was happening at Estabrook a few years back about social media encouraging people to bring their dogs and so forth. Um, so I guess I'm wondering what the plan, what kind of a response we can we can make to the, especially the swimming and overcrowding in the Sachem's Pond area. Do you hear it or do I see you around? Yep. Go ahead. But unmute yourself. So, sorry. Um, so as far as the, the points that Carmen had raised, um, Susan, that you noted about the, the rainbow trout um, stalking at the pond, I think both that species as well as the timing of that stalking needs to be addressed with the state. And I think that we can do that. I agree, Carmen, that um, winter or fall stocking is probably not something the state should be pursuing anymore because we're not seeing the pond freezing over and that's not something that's going to change. Um, so I, I'm, I'm happy to take on that you know, um, conversation with the state. It's ultimately their decision. It is a great pond in accordance with chapter 91. We don't have any ability to say that they can or cannot do that. But I think we can have some productive conversations with them. Thank you. Uh, as far as swimming and, you know, the deterioration of the slopes at um, Cove, I think the efforts that the town has undertaken to respond to that, to fix that, have been pretty um, effective, but that we do need to continue to do, we have to do continued signage and have a continued presence to keep people off the slopes to ensure that that restoration effort is able to be kept intact. Um, and, you know, we are committed, it's been a crazy summer. We have been in just the midst of a pandemic and it has been really, really crazy. I'm sure it's been crazy for all of you, certainly from the town's perspective. We are busier than we have ever been, I can say from personal experience. So I, I, I feel badly and I apologize that we have not been able to have a, you know boots on the ground at the Cove, but we haven't and we're doing our best to try and fix that. I don't know if we will be able to 
have anybody, you know, during this season, we will see. And please just be patient while we try to figure through that. But regardless, we're already having conversations around what do we need to do in terms of, we understand the web presence, we understand the opening of the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail. And, you know, the town, I would say, is committed to figuring out how to address this. It may not be immediate. We will get there, you know, and all the input from everybody helpful, um, very helpful. And the work of the White Pond Advisory Committee is super, super appreciated. Um, but we're just, we're just, you know, we don't have all the answers right at this time. Right. Um, um, Terry? I just want to uh, thank Dilly for that and ask you if when you're talking with the state, um, would a letter from the select board help in any way? Okay, well, I would definitely. Big time. Would <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to draft it for you um, if that is, if that's something that you would like. Um, so I think what, uh, I thank you all for your comments and, and your input I, on this. Can I ask one more question? I'm sorry. Um, it's of Delia. Does the, is the town saying that swimming at St. Jim's is illegal or allowed? So, so the position of the town is that at this time, as it has been since the Sperry land was acquired in the early 1990s, swimming from town land at St. Jim's Cove is not permitted. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't, if I can, Mike, I don't know, I wouldn't equate that with being illegal. It's just unauthorized. And as Delia noted, it's just been, it's been a tough year in many ways, but um, there's been so many confusing things that I do think that we are going to, we're trying to fix this year as well, but there's just more people around and, and problems that I've heard from you, from, from the folks on from the committee have been longstanding. We're just yeah. greatly exacerbated this year. Uh, and so, and we're, we're also, we're also the new owners or relatively new owners. I even know we've owned Sachem's Cove, um, you know, overall control of White Pond is still relatively new for us. And so there are a number of things that, that we are actively working to figure out. So I, I extend um, Delia's, Delia's apology. I apologize that we didn't do a better job of having the Ranger program ready when it was needed. Um, and that's my, and that's my responsibility. So um, all I can say is we just have to try and, Know, hang in there on this and, and try and find solutions that we can you know implement relatively easily in, in the circumstances well what i'm going to suggest is that and i'm not going to put a time frame on it uh, but i'm going to suggest that um, you get back to us meeting you and delia with a response to this report uh I, it's not so much apologizing just but what are we what steps is the town prepared to take uh, in order to try to protect this resource. Um, and I think it would just be good if we could get that back to the select board so that they could try to act on it. Uh, and I'd be more than happy to entertain a motion to uh, draft a letter on behalf of the select board to go to, is it, is it fish and wildlife at the state level or is it a different? I think it's fishing game now, is it? Fishing game. Well, it's fishing game. The state is responsible for stocking fish. Yeah, right. right. So, yeah. So I would entertain a motion to have the select board prepare a letter and do it. We'll take you up on on your suggestion to uh, to to draft that letter. So Linda, can you uh, help us out? Okay. Um, move to authorize the chair uh, to uh, uh, sign a letter on behalf of the select board to. Fish and game um, regarding our concerns about the stocking of White Pond. Our second. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none, would the court please call the roll? Ackerman. Aye. Ms. Bates. Aye. Ms. Hotchkiss. Aye. Mr. Lawson. Aye. Myself, Ms. Escobedo. Aye. Thank you. And I know it passes unanimously. I want to thank you all for. Uh, 
coming and speaking to us about this, and we'll look forward to uh, next steps as we move along. So thank you all. Thank the you. next uh, item on our agenda is a discussion of liquor license rebates. I think you all received um, today from the financial officer. Uh, for those in the audience, this is the issue of should we consider rebating a portion of the liquor license to those restaurants that were on the one hand closed at the early stages of the pandemic. And then even when they were allowed to reopen for takeout for a while, they were not allowed to sell or alcoholic beverages and the issue was should we think about rebating 25% uh, of their liquor license and uh, I think it was this was actually prepared by the town clerk but sent to us this afternoon by the chief financial officer. So any comments or anybody wants Mr. Town Manager? So yes Mike so we did talk a little bit about whether or not we should do this we felt given the, the timeline just laid out a 25% and, and you can call it a rebate. It really is a credit towards the renewal of the license for next year. Um, and so because it's, because it's a credit, it's money that we're not going to receive. And so we don't need to have, um, it'll be lost revenue versus an additional appropriation. I just want to make sure it, and the total cost is about $16,700. Yes. So it's not, it's not a massive amount of money. And so we, in talking to the chief financial officer, we do feel like, Issuing this credit against the next against the renewal fee um, is reasonable, and that the town can absorb that loss of revenue, um, or we'll figure out a way to do it between now and the end of FY21. Um, all right, uh, um, I think in my mind, and I'm happy to go along with that proposal. But in my mind, the difference was that a rebate, if if it's possible to be done, would actually put money in the hands of the restaurants now, as opposed to not having them make some kind of payment. Uh, I'm not, I mean, the savings is a savings and I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, we, can, we, we can do it either way. It just is, it's a lot, it's a lot more, um, it's a lot more effort and then it would be a, an expenditure. Um, that we would then have to, and we could potentially amend the, F, the proposed FY21 budget and put something in there for that purpose, um, and then and that would be available. Um, okay, so the kind of motion that you, you and uh, Mr. Lafour be in favor of them is a twenty five percent credit mm -hmm. on the liquor license for these establishments for the next uh, licensing period. That that that's what. We have figured now, but if the if the board prefers a, a rebate, we can do that. It would just require, like I said, we, we, we can have we can amend the but we it wouldn't be covered by the one twelve budget. And so once we have our town meeting in September, we could certainly, you know, modify the budget that will be going before town meeting. It's it's a minor adjustment. So I will I'll defer to the board. All right. Susan? I just have a clarifying question. What is the um the uh, period that li liquor license is valid, is it the calendar year or? Yeah. It's calendar year. Calendar year. Okay, yeah. thanks. And when you get to be the clerk, you'll know that because you'll have a stack as high as your elbows of the licenses to sign. I can't wait. Linda? Yeah, thank you. So, um, one question I have about whether it's a rebate or um, a, a credit um, has to do with the potential for this to be covered under the COVID-19 funds, CARES Act. Um, so that might make a difference in terms of how it's framed. Um, and then the second comment I would make about this, and, and I, I don't have um, clarity of this in my own mind even, but given the um, legal advice that we've received regarding another item on the agendas uh, today for small businesses, whether or not some of the same issues there apply to this um, potential rebate. I I'm generally in support of trying to help small businesses given the, the challenges that they've had to face, um, but that additional advice that came in for the other issue 
gave me pause. Well, I think the difference, uh, the well, an important difference is that the article, the issue we're going to talk about next on the agenda requires an appropriation. And this is not an appropriation. So the, there's a significant difference. The other article providing funds, would you have to appropriate the money. And that would take probably a town meeting vote to be able to do this. This is not something that is an appropriation. So it was a rebate or a credit, which can be done by the select board. Is that right, Stephen? Is that yeah, that would be that would that would be how I would would answer that question. It's the difference right. is to, a, a town meeting action for an appropriation has not taken place to yeah. do the rebate, which is why we would put it in um, as a part of our budget. Uh, or, um, but you but you could as a as a credit because um, you're you're basically you're it's, it's you're you're giving up, you're giving up revenue instead of making an expenditure. Yeah. Uh, I know it seems like it's a bit of a Distinction without a difference, but from a financial standpoint, it, it makes a big difference. And in terms of CARES Act, I think we, I, I think, well, I, I'm positive that CARES Act for, for direct business assistance is not allowed by DOR. Um, but I do think in terms of the town's loss of revenue or even the issuance of a rebate, we certainly could ask the Department of Revenue if they view that as a COVID related expense to the town. Um, you know, I think that that's a, a reasonable question to ask, but I don't, I know it's in terms of like having it off to the cost for the businesses. And I know that is not allowed currently. And I suspect even that question will be denied by DOR. Right. That's, it's probably worth asking. Uh, Terry. Uh, I'd like to uh, support the small businesses and I think their cash flow is probably a real important consideration. But I'm thinking about the timing also. Like if this was um, early in the calendar year, I think it would be really worth doing the rebate. But I'm thinking about the timing that we go to town meeting in the middle of September. By the time the businesses get their rebate back, back from us, it's going to be at least October. And then December is when they, I think they have to pay license for next year so it's 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 not a whole lot of time in there and it might make a big difference to a small business but you're talking at two months at the most it might be uh, more like six weeks so i think there's an issue there's this does not have to go to town meeting if the select board approves this i don't know how quickly the, the chief financial officer can get this done but but it does not need to wait until town meeting. This could get done by by the end of this week, I'm sure, if we decided to do this as a rebate. Am I correct, Stephen? I, I, like I said, I think we, we could probably figure it out um, yeah. in terms of uh, uh, in terms of the funding. You're right, this is a, this is strictly a, a policy decision by the license commission, and that's you. So we don't need to wait until September 13th. Mm -hmm. Still, you're you're correct, it's just a couple of months difference, but what I'm hearing from business is that, you know, for some of these people, this might matter. There's, All right, so what's, uh, Linda? Sorry, Mike. Um, you know, I'm, um, there's a potential conflict for, for, for a couple of these uh, businesses, I would guess, who also received a, uh, PPP uh, grant loan grant funding from the through the state for payroll, right? And there and there's regulations where there might be some kind of conflict, and in terms of accepting funds from different sources. I'm not following that. What what, what you mean? Yeah, me so um, as an example, when the, with the micro enterprise uh, grant funds, um, there was specific language in there talking about to the extent that some of the funds hadn't been funded through other federal COVID related funding sources. Okay. Um, is that, if, to the extent that Linda's uh, question has, 
you know, I, I haven't thought about it. I don't know whether it has, it's accurate or not, but is that where the rebate would help us if we rebated versus, um, versus proactively um, uh, gave the money this, this fiscal year? Stephen, do you want to comment on that? I don't have an answer to that. Yeah, I don't have an answer. To I, I do know that there was that there are some um, strings like that attached to certain funding. Um, so why don't why don't we do this? You could authorize me to issue the credit or the rebate, um, and just give me the chance to uh, do a little more digging on that. Uh, to see if that is in fact a conflict or it may it may be other federal funds or other state funds it may not that restriction may not apply uh, to local funding right. um, and so we can we can make sure that we have the eyes to audience I know other communities have done this um, yeah. I think Acton did it last month uh, now I don't know if they asked I don't know if they just said well we'll just ask for forgiveness if, if we made a, a mistake or if they had done the level the research I, I know that in talking to the manager in Acton they um, I don't believe ran it past um, their council, and you know, it just seemed like a pretty straightforward thing that we could do. So uh, we can certainly answer those questions, though. And if, and if, for the sake of timeliness, if you just wanted to authorize me to process them as presented in, in the spreadsheet that you got from Kerry, uh, we can do that. So certainly, my intention in raising these questions um, is not to in obstruct helping the small businesses in this way but to make sure that we're just on sound footing in terms of how the town is proceeding with this. That's sure. really what my intention is. Absolutely. Yep. So uh, let's proceed that way, but still I need resolution on rebate versus credit. So, I, so I, I just asked Stephen, what have you heard from other towns? What, what mechanism have they used, a rebate or credit? No one I know of is acting. I think they did a rebate. They did a rebate. All right, rebate or credit? Carrie. Uh, I I think the important thing is to support it and uh, get that twenty five percent back to the businesses. But I I don't care which method we use. Um, maybe even let the town manager figure that part out. I think the important thing is does the select board approve the idea of um, giving back this 25% and then the details, the weeds of it to let the manager figure it out. Susan? I agree with what Terry said and I think the mechanism um, we are pretty much two thirds of the way through the year. And um, so I could see the, the uh, wisdom to doing a credit for next year. But I, again, I, I think I'd leave that to the discretion of the town manager. Linda? Yeah, I, um, I generally would support, I think the rebate for the, uh, so that there's the opportunity to recoup through the COVID funds if possible. I, I agree. I, I just would only um, and, and as as Linda um, said, my this should not be taken as anything other than supportive of, of small business of all the businesses in town um, right now. But I, 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 I am not a big fan of ask for forgiveness if we can if we can do a little bit of homework now. So I would encourage the town manager to just you know go that route. I didn't think I heard rebate or credit for me. I, I, I don't have an opinion one way or the other. I, I want to see, make sure they're All right. Helped. So that, uh, I, I'm in favor of a rebate, but that doesn't seem to matter. It seems to be a majority around uh, authorizing the town manager uh, in his discretion to decide to grant a 25% rebate or 25% credit to next year's license. Um, so, Linda, if you can help us craft a motion to that effect, uh, it would be appreciated. Mm -hmm. Move to authorize the town manager um, to um, rebate 25% um, 
of the um, liquor license fee uh, for 20, FY 2020, correct? Or, hmm? or provide a 25% credit. Okay, or provide a 25% credit toward- yeah, FY 21 uh, license. Yeah. For, for the 2021 license, yeah. For, right, 20, FY 21 liquor license renewal. Okay, so second? Second. Okay, so this is authorizing the town manager at his discretion to generate a 25% rebate to those retail establishments with a liquor license or to grant for fiscal 20 or to grant them a 25% uh, credit on their liquor license for fiscal 21. Okay, is there any further discussion? Would the clerk please call the roll? There was a second. I think there was, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Ms. Ackerman? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. Ms. Hodgkiss? Aye. Mr. Lawson? Aye. Ms. Uh, I thank you. I know it passes unanimously. And thank you, Stephen, Carrie, and Kari for getting this information to us. The next item on our agenda is a discussion of the local business assistance proposal and town council's review and opinion on that proposal. Stephen, do you wanna tee this sure. up? Sure. So the, we, we did waive, uh, after conferring with, with Mina, um, we did, um, we did waive um, confidentiality, we did waive privilege for the opinion because the audience really was, the, it's really the board, but the economic vitality committee as well. And, um, it was in response to a proposal submitted to the Economic Vitality Committee by uh, Henry Dane um, about using the civil defense powers um, that we, under our declared state of emergency, to create a way to um, have a funding mechanism to provide direct assistance to local businesses, which, um, you know, we we kind of talked about it. We we had gotten an initial reading from Bond Council that that was not um, that that was that didn't seem to fit with his understanding of it. And if you read Mina's opinion, uh, he you know he writes the he, he writes them you know short answer and then analysis. And the short answer is is really no. But the issue that and I, this is kind of what I've been saying is without a town meeting vote of some kind um, to. Uh, even just to, even through a budget to appropriate um, for you know funds for this purpose, it isn't really lawful, um, be, especially under the anti-aid amendment. Um, and so, one of the things we're we're trying to work on is is trying to develop a program that we could then potentially get funded through a town meeting to to provide assistance. Um, but it's 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 more complicated. Um, then I think it looks on its face in terms of settings. I mean, I've worked for a number of municipalities and um, several of them had such programs, but they were, um, I, would, I would say pretty, bureauc pretty bureaucratic. Uh, they had a lot of, they had a lot of, like Linda, you know, a lot of strings attached to them and, and setting them up takes some work. But I think that the point um, I don't want to be lost is we want to try and do something um, and support our, our local business community in, in every possible way. and, and it's just the idea of direct funding to businesses is, is, is complicated. Yeah. It seemed quite clear in, in, um, in Mina's response here that uh, the only really effective way to be able to, to, to do this is to, we've got to put together some kind of award article that would have to go to town meeting. Um, I think even if, even if we could sort of wave our magic wand by ourselves, this would be an important, an important policy matter for the town that my view would be you'd have to go to town, you should go to town meeting anyway, uh, even if you didn't meet it for, for the appropriation. But I, I, so, you know, I think we ought to see if we could put this together. I don't know, I don't think we can get it done for this town meeting that's going to be in September and 
but we're going to have another town meeting in April, and I, it seems to me that this would be something to really work on to see if we could put together a comprehensive warrant article that could create this fund. You know, the town would have to decide whether it wanted to do it or not, uh, but it would essentially be like creating a stabilization fund of some, not, not the right words, I'm sure, but a stabilization fund that could be accessed under certain kinds of conditions. Uh, so I think that given how fragile the retail establishments are now with the internet and these large conglomerate companies that are doing all this online stuff and, and how important the local business community is to the very character of our town, uh, I would really like to see us try to do something like this. So, um... And just based on my experience, the, the, the thing that really is, is the most difficult to figure out is how do you create security for the taxpayers? Um, how do you protect taxpayers from defaults? Uh, and, and, you know, because if it's funded by the taxpayers, they should enjoy the benefit of some level of protection in case it doesn't work out. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why when, when Concord together formed and partnered with the community chest for a, a grant program to businesses. We, um, you know, we won't, we've been trying to support that. In fact, the, the, we don't, we don't, we're not charging for the movies, but there's a link to donate to that fund uh, right where you sign up for the drive-in movie passes. And we've tried to facilitate ways to support contributions to that because there's no, it, that's just, it's, I don't, I'm going to say, I'm not going to say it's stringless money, but it is money that is donated by people that can be used much more flexibly than something that the town would come up with. Um, and, and so well, I do think you're right, Mike. I, in fact, I, I, I've been kind of starting this conversation and trying to figure out what's the right form. You know, I, I've seen facade improvement grants. I've seen, um, you know, uh, grants for businesses to go into certain areas. I mean, there's, there's, there's a, a lot of different ways to, 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 sh to, to craft this. But again, the biggest issue is how do you provide some securitization um, to tax? But as, but Stephen, as you've said, though, other towns have done this. Mm -hmm. So um, certainly, unless they had their heads in the sand, this would be a question that those towns would have had to wrestle with as well. So well, I suspect that if we poke around a little bit, we we might be able to find out how they've dealt with that issue. It's yeah, it, important. yeah, it wouldn't, it would, I guess the, way, the reason I say that, Mike, is the towns have these, but they've, they've had them for a while. Like they, they start these programs in non COVID times. And so yeah. they have complex like loan agreements and things like that. The reason I bring that up now is it's one of the reasons why it would be very difficult to do this quickly. Yeah. Well, I don't, uh, I, I agree. It might be very difficult to do this quickly, but I'm sure like to see us get started on this. Is there any other comments from the board? Yeah, I, um, yeah, I say that. Henry, we're gonna hear from the board first and I'd be happy to hear from you. So, um, oh, well, go ahead, yes. Uh, I, in reading Mina's um, uh, opinion, I was kind of, I thought the piece that was kind of, it was particularly daunting was the DOR would want to make sure that this grant, there was no double dipping, that this grant was, if the town had a fund and a, and a loan uh, opportunity, that it didn't cover anything that was already covered in PPP or any other grant program, which means that's pretty complicated, it seems to me. I don't know what, a, what other, um, so funding sources they want to or funding uses they would want to make sure we're not already being covered by something else but well to me these are all discoverable uh, we don't know the answers to them but I yeah. suspect we can get this figured out other comments from the board seeing now Mr. Dane yes thank you <clears throat> um, for the record Henry yes Henry Dane um, 58 Everett Street. Thank you. Uh, the, um, I wish I had seen the, uh, the response from town council uh, and I'd be better prepared to respond if I had. Um, <clears throat> uh, so uh, I'll just go on the basis of um, the few remarks that have been made. 
one of the issues is the need is not even now, the need is yesterday. Um, and we see businesses already disappearing. And just as with the rebate on the liquor licenses, if you debate about the budgetary impact of that, you may be giving people a credit who are not able to renew their liquor license for next year because they've gone out of business. So a, a credit against next year's liquor license doesn't have the value of helping to keep people in business today. And this is very critical. And if we try to go through the elaborate mechanisms to create all the security you want to create in order to make this happen, it's going to be definitely too little, too late, and it will probably have very little impact because the, all of the chips will have fallen by then. Um, um, I understand the difficulties of administering something like this, but certainly app application forms can be developed that would solicit the inf information that you need. They could be signed under oath. People could sign promissory notes. These are routine kinds of things. But the most important factor is that all these powers are given in the civil uh, the Civil Defense Act and in the other statute related about uh, appropriations, there is not a single word in that act about action by town meeting or appropriation by town meeting. It is all that the town may appropriate or borrow funds, enter into contracts and make expenditures without going through the usual formalities. Um, there is provision for an appointment of a civil defense director, which would be the town manager who would have all of these powers. And if, if this could not be done without action of the town meeting, it would essentially be useless in terms of dealing with an emergency. If it was kind of the kind of emergency that was originally contemplated by the Civil Defense Act, insurrection, tornadoes, earthquakes, and so on, I can't imagine that they contemplated that you would go and have to have a special town meeting to fill sandbags for the river because the river was overflowing or a tornado had gone through town. The point of it is so that the board or its designated agents can um, take necessary action, make the agreements, uh, appropriate the funds without going through those unnecessary formalities. Is this somewhat unprecedented? Yes, of course it is. And the, and the uh, um, uh, comparison with other, other towns that have had a um, community development financing programs is, 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 is irrelevant because it's, it's obvious that those were not under, those were not actions taken under the umbrella of the Civil Defense Act. We have an opportunity that has been presented to us to actually make a difference in the survival of an important part of the culture of our community. And um, I would, you know, I would like the opportunity actually to discuss this in detail with town council and talk about the specifics of the reasons for their opinion and I think also bond council is not the person we should be talking to. A program such as this does not necessarily require the issuing of issuance of bonds. It, it can be done with appropriations. Uh, and of course, we've had no trouble finding money in free cash or unexpended, uh, um, uh, unexpended budgetary items to finance other things to a much higher uh, level of dollars. And we certainly can find the money in free cash or unused appropriations or in direct appropriations in accordance with the um, direction of the Civil Defense Act. So um, if, if your reason for not wanting to pursue this further is that there are some problems, I would like to work with town council in finding out whether we can solve these problems because I think we can. Thank you. So, can, can I just clarify something? Sure. 
Uh, and I'm not, I don't want to litigate the, the matter here. I think town council's opinion, which I did send to you a few hours ago, Henry, is, um, is, is self-explanatory. The issue is not finding the money and, um, you know, the Civil Defense Act is, can be used for, as you described, but that's because there have already been existing appropriations for emergency response. If we incurred additional police costs and needed to raise money to pay that, you know, to pay those costs, we could do that because there's already been an appropriation for police costs. There is not an existing appropriation or authorization for direct assistance to businesses. And that's the issue that is it, kind, of, uh, kind of hang up. And because of the anti-aid amendment, um, and, and really the Civil Defense Act is for the town to fund itself, not to fund other businesses. But I've said till I was blue in the face how important the town supporting the local business community is in all the ways that we lawfully can, um, and even ways that we're not sure, you know? So I think that the, the fact that we don't have a pre-existing program to do this is the fundamental issue that we're that that you're not we're not connecting on. So that, I just want to make sure that, that the board is clear on that point. I'm not litigating. I'm just I'm just reading I'm just reading the statute, and I'm saying if what you what if what you say is true, it doesn't make any sense. If you can only spend money that had already been appropriated, because if it had already been appropriated, you wouldn't need the Civil Defense Act to spend it. So thank you. I appreciate it. Um, what I would like to do is see if we can make some progress on this in terms of doing some homework to find out what some other towns have done. I'm happy to take the lead on that because I think it's very important and see if we can get this back on our agenda. I don't know, don't know exactly when, but as, as soon as we have uh, relevant information so that we can discuss this further. That seem like an appropriate path forward. All right, thank you very much. So um, it just Yes, I do have just uh, I do have Mina is already working on on trying to find uh, a, a way of our, of writing a warrant article that could maybe accomplish what we want. So Good. that that process is already going. That's great. Thank you very much. Steve. All right. So then uh, the next one we don't have any committee nominations. The next is committee liaison reports. I don't know who would like to go first, but I'm happy to turn to Jane. Thank you. And um, I'll just take the White Pond um, uh, long report as part of the committee reports that I won't offer. Um, I had the Ag Committee, um, which met, uh, actually, I, I managed to somehow do two committee meetings at the same time with the power of Zoom on two computers. Cool. Uh, the Ag Committee voted to hold Ag Week instead of um, Ag Day. Uh, with the idea being activities and, and farm stands featured at individual farms throughout the week and promoted in coordination with the Economic Vitality Committee and the town manager's office and others. But um, rather than trying to consolidate um, the farms all in, you know, at Kai's Road or in one spot. Jane, would you, um, on behalf of the board, invite somebody from the Ag Committee to come to a next meeting and sort of go over the details and as a little publicity for it as opposed to explanation. Yep. That would be great. Happy to do that. Thank you. Um, and the Historic Districts Committee um, met and um, I think the item that was being followed most closely was the library um, amendments and uh, functionally they, they voted to separate the um, the uh, certificate of, appropriate, uh, of appropriateness to demolish part, portions of the building and construct a single story addition linking the Haywood Benjamin House to the Concord Public, uh, Free Public Library and the renovations of the building and then making other numerous site improvements with respect to the uh, footprint of the story craft room, including the windows. All, all of these were submitted, these, these amendments, um, and they uh, remove or withdrew without prejudice the amendment on the parking, um, their further amendment on parking. Um, and uh, that was voted in favor. So they separated the parking from the rest of the application. Okay, thank um, you. Yep. Uh, who's next? Gary? 
Okay, thank you. I might I might lose power uh, on my computer, so I'll I'll. Go fast. Yeah, uh, the HDC meeting I I did attend and watch that, and also I watched both finance committee meetings, where uh, both the schools and the town gave excellent presentations on the town budget that's going to be coming up um, at town meeting. I also enjoyed the library curbside um, process for the first time this week. It was excellent. And I attended a racial justice event with Senator Markey on our town common. I think Mike was there, Stephen was there. That's it. Thank you. Susan? On mute. Yep. Um, I watched the uh, Economic Vitality Committee meeting um, and they continued the initiatives that they've been working on. They are wanting to hone in a little bit on um, access for businesses in the uh, holiday season because it's so restricted given the square footage and staff and you know the, the uh, people allowed in the premises and how to how to work with that mm -hmm. um, that the movie was a big success as Stephen mentioned and um, the uh, fund through the community chest has awarded a number of grants and they're getting close to uh, their $100,000 match. They have a few 20 some thousand dollars to go. So once that's donated by citizens, they uh, will get a $100,000 match from a donor. And that's it. Thank you, Linda. Um, among the meetings I attended uh, were the um, NMI Reuse Planning Committee. Um, they discussed the results of the survey. Uh, they were very, um, on many of the dimensions of that survey, there were some mixed results in terms of whether people wanted to see housing or no housing there, whether how much of the, the uh, property they wanted environmentally um, open space versus uh, some development proposals that were included in the survey. They also um, heard an additional um, suggestion for development, which included a, cl a cloud computing center and a related institute that would have regional significance in terms of working with uh, other uh, universities, colleges, and businesses. Um, so someone came in to speak about that idea. And I just think um, what that accomplished was to sort of open up the thinking in terms of how um, that property might be able to meet multiple objectives, deal with some of the concerns about re uh, residency, uh, oc oc occupancy uh, in terms of housing and some other things and still bring in some development money uh, to make that property viable uh, for the town in terms of putting it together. Um, they, in that same vein, uh, they've invited um, someone from Fort Devens planning to come in and speak to them at their next meeting to, again, pursue this whole um, line of thinking. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, I attend a school committee joint, a school committee meeting uh, where they approved the reopening plan and the, that you heard earlier this evening and revised calendar for 2021. Uh, they also discussed uh, budgets uh, and uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. And then on August uh, the 4th, I attended the finance committee meeting where they dealt with school budgets. Um, and in particular, I think at the conclusion of, of conclusion, they were of the opinion that the uh, school should try to come up with some additional savings and they authorized the chair to send a note to the schools. and. The schools are meeting tomorrow night, and I know that's on their agenda. And I then met again with the Finance Committee on Thursday, August 6th, where they took up the town budget, uh, which we saw uh, previously in that week on uh, August, uh, August the 3rd. And they also had a uh, discussion of their fiscal 21 tax impact analysis. So that's my report. And so next item on our agenda is correspondence. The correspondence was distributed with the uh, packet. 
And so next is public comments. If there's anybody who wants to make a public comment, uh, unmute yourself and say your name and, and we'll get back to you. I don't see any, so I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Move. Second. Second. Would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Ackerman? Aye. Ms. Bates? Aye. Oh, Ms. Hotchkiss? Aye. Mr. Lawson? Aye. Myself, Ms. Escobedo, aye. I note that it passes unanimously. Thank you all for attending. Stay well. <laughs>